Okay, hi everyone. So I thought today we would talk a little bit about the current status of the physics project and uh, then do a general Q&A about whatever people would like to talk about. So, okay, well, things have been progressing really well as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I think that the, um, uh, it's kind of often this way. The more you understand, the further you can see and the more you can understand. And we're kind of in that loop of progressively understanding more and more. And I would say <clears throat> there are some sort of meta things we're understanding and there's some things we're understanding actually about details of physics. So at a meta level, I think one of the most significant things we're understanding is that there are a lot of abstract um, uh, kind of um, uh, mathematical structures, whether they're from category theory, topos theory, theory of uh, uh, you know, all kinds of um, uh, you know, infinity categories, all, all, the, all sorts of obscure, seemingly obscure and deeply abstract mathematical areas. And the thing that's really interesting is it seems like this project is sort of emerging as a kind of Rosetta stone of connections between these areas and ways to sort of concretify these areas. And I think the way I am sort of beginning to think about it is, it's like you could imagine all sorts of abstract models of computation, lambda calculus, combinators, things like that. And then you've got Turing machines, which are kind of a, a much more concrete view of what computation is. And I think similarly, what we're seeing with this project is that what we've got is a sort of concrete view of a certain kinds of abstraction. And in particular, I think the kind of abstraction that we're really dealing with is this uh, type of, when there is a system where there's a lot of freedom in that system, but where you're only able to be sensitive to certain uh, sort of uh, um, modded out aspects of the system. So what do I mean by this? It's like, you're thinking about space-time, all you know about are causal connections between things in space-time. And you kind of, your, your underlying description of space-time might contain a lot more information, but all you as an observer are sensitive to is that kind of causal connection data. And um, so, you know, we're seeing just a lot of these kinds of systems where there's sort of a, an underlying description language that can be quite complicated, but where sort of what you're sensitive to is something which is just a, a higher level of, a, of, of in, in the system. And what we're realizing is sort of physics as it has evolved so far, theoretical physics as it has evolved so far, is really keying into these places where there is this sort of higher level description that's available. I mean, we, we fundamentally expect that from the very lowest level machine code of the universe, so to speak, that there will be a layer of computational irreducibility um, that will be very unpredictable, so to speak. Given even given the rule, it can take you know ten to the one hundred steps or something for you to work out what will happen. But the question, but but what we're seeing is that certain aspects of the universe, uh, which are the ones that physics has keyed into, are ones where you can make statements even without solving that irreducibility problem. And I think that's some. Um, but what we're realizing is those sorts of reducibility aspects of reducibility are the same aspects of reducibility that are showing up in lots of these abstract systems. I think that's one of, one of the interesting things is the realization that there's this kind of, that we're, 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 this project is sort of emerging as a, as a place where you can attach a lot of these abstract formalisms and, and get something that is uh, more concretely understandable from these formalisms and potentially take what's been discovered in these formalisms and apply it in really interesting ways to what we are doing with this project. So that's one thing. At sort of a meta level. Okay, another, another thing I would say that, you know, people ask a lot about, okay, when will your model predict some new phenomenon in the universe? Well, we'll get to that. We've already got some indications of that. But I think what has become clear from sort of even just understanding history of science is the first stage here is what one might call theoretical predictions. That is, you look at a different area of, let's say, physics, and you say, does this explain what we already know in that area of physics? And so we've been progressively doing that for different areas of physics. We certainly haven't got through everything. I would say there's a checklist that we're going down and we're making progress in it. Um, and it's really sort of, it's very interesting the extent to which one needs new ideas, one needs new formalism, but one doesn't have to change the model to explain what's going on. So the, uh, the question here 
is um, uh, is sort of uh, what so so there's sort of as we go down this checklist, you know, I can say things we've reached, things we haven't reached. Um, I would say that um, uh, we are reaching a lot of stuff to do with quite a lot of stuff to do with cosmology, black holes, things like that. We haven't really dug in that seriously into the early universe yet. We need to do that. Another area that's really high on the list is particles you know, actually finding an electron and so on. I think what we've realized is that uh, there's, well, there's some new ideas about, about what, how we might think about electrons and so on mathematically in these models. But let me talk a little bit about the sort of the physics side of, of these models. I mean, what we're dealing with, I think I'm, I'm sort of increasingly uh, thinking that we should call these sort of points that are the, the things that appear, the elements that appear in our hypergraphs they really are kind of atoms of space. And what we're doing at the first level is we have these hypergraphs that are the relations between atoms of space. Um, and then we have rules that uh, uh, correspond to the updating of those, uh, of those relations and the atoms that exist and so on. So what we're realizing is there's a sort of hierarchy of levels. So the first level is the sort of the, the, the physical space level of there's this hypergraph and the connections in the hypergraph are sort of laid out in physical space. And the, the length of each of those connections is something like the elementary time multiplied by the speed of light. Um, th those, those, those connections, that are, the hypergraph is really laid out in physical space. So the next level is to look at all the possible branchings of, uh, of updates that can happen to this hypergraph. And that defines this multi-way graph and the transversals of the multi-way graph are this different kind of space that represents all these different states. And it represents just as uh, physical space can be thought of as telling us relations between atoms of space, between points in space. And we can measure distances between points in space and so on. So similarly, when we're looking at this multi-way graph of all possible of the sort of the, the network of all possible updates, we can look at the distance between things that are generated by those updates in what we call branchial space, the space of, of branching structures um, produced in this multi-way graph. And that branchial space, the extent of that, that branchial space is a kind of map. The, the, the points in that branchial space are now essentially quantum states. And the, the, uh, uh, the, the sort of the, the extent of branchial space is kind of a map of entanglements between quantum states. And so sort of the distance in branchial space is kind of an entanglement distance between quantum states. And so what we're seeing there is that is the arena in which quantum mechanics plays out. Quantum mechanics is inevitable in our models. It comes because there are multiple choices of how the update rules can get applied to the spatial hypergraph. And those different paths correspond to the different possible sort of things that need to be accounted for in quantum mechanics. So we have a bunch of new understandings of how quantum mechanics, how to think about quantum mechanics. Let me mention one that, um, that we haven't really figured out in too much detail, but it's, it's interesting to think about. It's a concept I'm calling multi-space. And what it is, is it's the combination of space, physical space, and branchial space. So I've said this, this spatial hypergraph is laid out in physical space. Each instance of the spatial hypergraph is laid out in physical space. But there's also this branchial space that represents, in some sense, different possible spatial hypergraphs. But actually, things are much more interwoven than that. And so what, when you're looking at physical space, there will be, you can think of it as there's this region of physical space where sort of all the different branches might agree. And then there's this kind of uh, tower, there's this place where, where there isn't sort of a consensus version of space, where instead there's many branches of what space can be like in that particular in that particular place. And so we can think about, so we have been thinking about physical space, it's one instance on the, on the multi-way graph, branchial space, it's the map of all instances of, in a sense, complete universes, complete quantum states in the multi-way graph. This multi-space idea is sort of a merger of those two things in which we're thinking about sort of physical space, but in sort of the other direction, we're thinking of, of it, it sort of, uh, 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 budding out in the branchial direction. So it's as if you've got physical space, 
But at every point in physical space, there might be a whole stack of different possibilities in branchial space. Now, knitting together those things is complicated. And I've been doing some experiments and visualizing that. Uh, Max has been working on an actual code that will uh, make local multi-way uh, graphs to be able to implement that efficiently. But um, we don't yet know quite how to visualize it. But kind of the, the qualitative picture is you've sort of got sort of a consensus version of space. There won't really be a full consensus pretty much anywhere, but, but imagine that you could sort of have a consensus version of space sort of laid out in the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction, you have these kind of stacks of different branchial possibilities. And so it's as if those stacks of branchial possibilities are the different possible quantum states that represent what could be going on at that point in physical space. And so this, this idea of multi-space is kind of a way of packaging uh, physical space together with branchial space, together with quantum space. And I think this will be a, a, a valuable way to understand more about, about how things work. One particular example is particles. We've been thinking about particles propagating in physical space. And we imagine those particles as being essentially some kind of topological-like obstructions in the multi-way graph. In the same way that, you know, in something like a fluid, you might have a vortex where you have this sort of... Uh, uh, a circulation of fluid, and there's a there's you can move this vortex around, but there's sort of a core to the vortex that has some sort of topological stability to it. We're imagining something similar happening in the physical spatial hypergraph. But one of the questions then is, what happens in the branchial direction? What are particles in branchial space like? We don't really know yet. And that's very relevant when we think about things like quantization of spin. We need to understand what particles are like in branchial space. And I think that the um, the way that that um, uh, the way that that sort of plays out um, is something that multispace will help us try to understand, and will help us try to give a a a, um, a way of thinking about the notion of what is essentially spatial localization, and possibly also branchial localization for particle-like excitation, so to speak, in the system. Now, one of the things I we've been thinking about is is sort of what's the right meta model for particles. We know qualitatively what it's about. We know it is a somehow stable, locally stable lump of stuff propagating in our system. But how do we characterize a locally stable lump of stuff? You know, in, in, um, if we look in, I don't know, condensed matter physics or something, we'll find these sort of topological excitations. In a continuous system, there's a notion of something like homotopy, something like whether, the, whether you can, uh, uh, whether there's sort of an irreducible uh, like in a vortex, for example, there's sort of an irreducible uh, piece of vorticity that even, you know, you look around sort of a, a, a loop around the core of the vortex and you'll always see that things sort of go around that vortex and you can move it around a bit. And so long as, you're, so long as the core of the vortex is inside your loop, you'll always conclude when you do integrals or something that there is a vortex in there. So it's a sort of a way in a continuous system of seeing how some sort of discrete structure arises. And the question is, to what extent how should we think about particles in our systems? Should we think about them in terms of something like homotopy? Should we think about them in terms of uh, you know, something, um, uh, some other kind of way of characterizing discrete features of, of spaces? Now, having said that, our space is not fundamentally uh, continuous. A lot of the mathematics of how, of, of extracting discrete things from continuous spaces, there's all that mathematics. But our space is probably is very, very fine. And so it's, it's been, you know, that there's, there's just a lot of nodes in the universe. And so it's reasonable to try and use mathematical ideas that come from continuous mathematics as a way to characterize sort of large scale discreteness within this fine grained discreteness, I think. So another thing that's sort of an analogy for particles is black holes, where there is a a region of the spatial graph or the causal graph that have certain features. It's a region that has some sort of stability in the sense that it has, for example, causal edges going into it, but not coming out of it. And there's a definite region that has those properties. So one of the kind of questions is, you know, should we be thinking about particles as something like black holes in our space? Should we think about them in terms of some map of causal edges and some kind of uh, stability of the, some kind of feature of the divergence of causal edges or something, you know, should we think about them that way? Remember that we have a model in which the dimension of space is not a constant kind of thing. 
And so it certainly remains a possibility that an electron, for example, is really a lump of higher dimensional space, let's say, that is localized in our physical space. We don't know yet. But so one of the, and, and I think one of the things we need to understand is the relationship between particles in physical space and particles in branchial space, because I think that's what's gonna give us things like quantization of spin. And we just don't really quite know how to do that. And we don't really know quite the mathematics that we should be using for it. May have something to do with cohomology, may have something to do with uh, some other kinds of approaches to, to continuous um, uh, mathematics. Maybe I mentioned one thing about continuous mathematics. You know, we, we sort of, there's a, in terms of the conceptual side of our models, it's really important that space is discrete, that there are atoms of space. We can talk about hypergraphs. We can talk about multi-way graphs. All those things are discrete. But in fact, as I say, in the actual universe, it may be discrete, but the actual scale of the discreteness is absolutely tiny. And so that means that uh, we can, uh, the, it, it's, it's useful to think about sort of mathematical idealizations where you're taking the infinite limit where things are continuous in that infinite limit. Maybe the mathematics that represents that continuous limit exists. Maybe it's mathematics that's already been developed. Maybe it hasn't. The continuous limit of our multi-way graphs seems really interesting, but that mathematics probably has not been developed yet. We're not sure. Um, the, uh, it, it's, um, uh, and you know, this may drive some development of that mathematics but, um, and it may be that, that ideas from other areas of mathematics, like ideas from algebraic topology or whatever else might be, or differential topology, all these different kinds of areas might be applicable, um, even though we don't yet know what kind of mathematical object we're, we're dealing with, and that still has to be figured out. But I think one thing that is sort of an interesting possibility is we think of what we're doing and we think about what we're doing in terms of atoms of space, discrete graphs, all these kinds of things, but maybe really, Another way to think about it is there is a continuous underlying mathematical structure, and we are seeing the discrete skeleton of that structure. Now, it's worth remembering that what we actually see as observers lives even far above the structures that we are actually describing in our models. So in other words, when we say we observers are sensitive to certain foliations of this space and we're looking at certain things, when we are modding down to the point where we have these foliations and, and we're looking at the properties of things on these foliations, it's, uh, we are looking only at the kind of the very, um, we're looking very sort of zoomed out to what our actual underlying model is talking about. So in other words, our underlying model is a low level machine code, but what we are sensitive to, what we are actually as observers uh, paying attention to is a much higher level description of the universe. And so it's not, uh, so, the sort of the current idea of our models is, okay, we got the low level, we've got something that's a reasonable guess at the low level machine code. Now let's build up and try and understand those higher level constructs that we observers are actually uh, sort of engaging with. But also you might say, well, let's actually go down below the machine code. Let's say there's another form of description that we could use that's just another way of describing things that will, when you say, well, what does that really mean? What it really means is the machine code. And that even lower level description could be some mathematical structure that could be thought of in terms of continuous mathematics, potentially. And, and, but then the sort of the low level machine code that we're identifying as the useful way to describe the universe could be something that could then be thought of as a skeleton of that underlying continuous system. Now, it is very likely that that underlying continuous system is super hard to describe, super hard to deal with. But there may be some attributes of it that are useful and that carry all the way through to this sort of level, the higher level at which we're actually uh, making contact as observers. So, okay, so that's, that's one, kind of, um, uh, one kind of thing. So uh, let me mention another, um, um, uh, I'll, I'll look at a few questions here. Let me, let me address some of those and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about quantum mechanics and I want to talk a little bit about Rulial space and questions like why the universe exists. Um, okay, so as the first question, has the glossary seen the light of day? I am so embarrassed. We have still not finished that. I'm going to work on it. And my only excuse is I've been working on a bulletin. We're, we're going to be announcing sort of things we figured out as sort of bulletins from this project. And I was doing a bulletin, which I thought was going to be really straightforward. And I thought was going to be done in a couple of days. And it's called, uh, I have it up on my screen here. I'll show it to you later. It's called Rulial Space, the Case of Turing Machines. Um, 
And as I said, I thought it was going to be really easy. I think I finally pretty much finished it now. Um, and it's probably 50 pages long now. I thought it was going to be like a five page modest thing that was all going to be straightforward, but it wasn't. And so that's been my personal excuse for why we haven't gotten the glossary done, but we're going to work on it. Um, and thank you for the, for the poke here. Um, OK, there's a question here from Amb. Can you speak about hypergraphs? How, how have they been used in physics and fundamental physics in the past? I don't think they have been. Um, I mean, hypergraphs are just a generalization of graphs in which instead of saying that there's an edge that joins two uh, vertices and nodes in the graph, you're saying that there's a hyper edge that can connect multiple vertices. There are many applications for hypergraphs, uh, whether it's in the description of email conversations or whether it's in something completely different. Um, but uh, uh, in physics, I, 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 I don't know of uses. I mean, it's very interesting that something like our multi-way graphs, uh, I'm going to try and write a bulletin called the many names of multi-way graphs, um, or many names of multi-way systems. Okay, so, you know, these, the same idea of sort of treeing out all the possibilities of something has arisen many times. And it has names, they're called bone trees. They're called uh, uh, poscow sets. They're called semi tui systems. They're called canonical systems. They're called, uh, gosh, all kinds of other things. Um, all of these are at some uh, abstract level, the same thing. And these have been invented. The first of the ones I just mentioned was invented in the 1920s. Um, but the sort of the merger of these things to make a coherent, I mean, our use of them is I would say, and possibly even our name for them is, is uh, is much more concrete. Well, even that maybe is not true. It's a, it's a more, let's say it's a more industrial scale use than has been made before. Um, but, but these abstract systems are, uh, are things that have arisen many times and uh, you know, making that sort of Rosetta Stone collection of, of connections between these different ways that, um, uh, that these, uh, the, these sort of abstractions have arisen, I think is important and we're hoping to do that. Um, let's see, Mark is asking atoms of space on what platform? So this is, uh, you know, this is sort of talking about the basics of our model, but, but this is purely abstract. These are points that are purely abstract things. All we know is the relations between these points by looking at that whole network of relations. That's what defines the structure of physical space. Um, and by looking at the kind of, uh, uh the progression in time, the progression through sort of the computations that are applied to that system, that's what defines sort of the knitting together of different parts of space and leading to space time and relativity and all those kinds of things. Uh, okay, there's a question from Sid. Can you summarize your consideration of the link to category theory? I wish I could summarize it better. I'm disappointed that I can't summarize it better. Um, I think here's the basic summary. I think that, uh, one categories, ordinary categories, we can think of our causal graphs. No, I'm sorry. We can think of our uh, um, hypergraphs as being a sort of mild generalization of uh, one categories. I think we can then think about our causal graphs in which we are talking about Actually, let me say that differently. I, I got that wrong. Let me let me let me back up and say that better. Um, I think the one categories are related to our multi-way graphs. I think that the two categories are related to the causal graph that emerges from looking at the connections between uh, uh, between sort of states in the causal in the multi-way graph. That's two categories. I think the three categories correspond to the uh, construction of foliations in our causal graphs. And the whole hierarchy of categories going up to the infinity category of growth and deke and so on, um, I'm sure that has an interpretation in our models. I just don't know what it is yet. Um, is it useful to think about what we're doing in terms of category theory? Possibly. I suspect category theory needs some generalization because I think there are particular axioms of category theory that. Um, are effectively not valid for our systems, but nevertheless, some of the structure and conclusions of category theory might apply even, um, uh, even when those, those uh, axioms don't, don't work. Um, 
maybe, let's see, I think we have Jonathan here. Maybe Jonathan would like to make a further comment on that. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, the, the basic hierarchical structure that you mentioned, I think, is, is pretty much right. Um, but there's, uh, b beyond just naively expressing, you know, our formulation in terms of, say, functors between one categories or something, I think that there's, there's a deeper level of, of stuff that category theory potentially has to offer us. Because, um, so in, and unfortunately, we didn't really, uh, for various reasons, we didn't get time to sort of discuss uh, many of these things in as much detail as I think we would have liked uh, on Tuesday. But um, so, for instance, in the in the sort of categorical foundations of quantum mechanics, right? People study these things called dagger symmetric monoidal categories, which are the sort of the the the, the, the generalized notion of, of a kind of, of a Hilbert space where where your your morphisms uh, represent kind of transformations between systems, and then and, and they're endowed with the structure. The category is endowed with this thing called a called a dagger operation, which is a sort of involution operation that, um, when applied to a morphism gives you a generalization of the notion of a Hermitian adjoint in, in standard quantum mechanics. So it allows you to define the notion of a, of a sort of Hermitian uh, morphism or a unitary morphism. Um, one, of the thing, one of the reasons why I think that's interesting is because it's, it, it's a significant generalization of the standard concepts of things like hermeticity and unitarity in quantum mechanics, which is also something that we're running into in our interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of multi-way systems, because our formulation of unitarity is actually kind of trivial in the context of multi-way systems. It's, it's just a statement of conservation of measure uh, in the multi-way evolution graph. And um, you know, th that's not something that fits neatly into the sort of standard Hilbert space formalism of quantum mechanics, but it seems like something that might fit very neatly into the categorical formulation, but we haven't yet figured out the details of that. Um, there are many other things like, uh, I think we mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit on Tuesday about how category theorists have developed a general technique for kind of thinking about the relationship between objects and their representations. So, you know, obviously in, in algebra, you have the notion of a group uh, which is an abstract concept, and then you can think about its representation, which is an act, which is thinking about the group in terms of its action on some concrete thing, a vector space. Um, category theory produces a, ge a grand generalization of that idea called a Tanakian duality, um, in which you can define a, a, what in category theory is a functor between uh, the object and it, and its and its Tanakian dual, it, it, its representation back again. And uh, we we have reason to believe that what we're doing in our, in our models. Um, you know, when we look at causal networks and we say that they're representing space-time in some sense, um, we, we, one, it's entirely possible that one can think of that as being a representation in, in some generalized notion of the group theoretic sense. And it's possible that, that category theory and the, these notions of Tanaki and formalism and so on uh, will, will give us a more general way of, of understanding that correspondence and therefore will help us solve some of the problems that Stephen was alluding to earlier about exactly how we understand formally what the, you know, what the continuum limit of the multi-way causal graph is. If there's a sort of, if there's a Tanakian way to think about that correspondence, that's potentially really, really useful. So that it's was still very me. I don't know, that was pretty technical, Jonathan, and I, I but, but um, I mean, that right. description <laughs> of the Tanakian duality was, I thought that was interesting. I, I think, um, uh, uh, fair enough. Well, so, you know, I would say about category theory in general, I mean, I, I think I, I said this in a discussion um, on Tuesday, I mean, a lot of people are afraid of category theory, and it's it's often couched in this very abstract ter terms. Um, it is, uh, you know, I, I think I am I am sort of um, I'm coming to terms with category theory, and I'm realizing that uh, actually it's, it's it's educational for me because I've been living kind of uh, uh, symbolic language descriptions for forty years now. And so for me, you know, higher order functions that are, you know, things that apply to functions that apply to this and so on, you know, I'm super used to this. And so it, um, uh, in a sense, it's interesting for me to see an alien formalism category theory and to see how comparatively difficult it is for me to wrap my brain around it. Um, I think in the end, uh, there will be some interesting things that can be done. Um, uh, okay, so so I have to say that, that uh, in some sense, our model here of elements and relations that correspond to hypergraphs, in a very bizarre sense, is a, is a content removed version of what I've been doing for 40 years in, in the design of symbolic languages and in the idea of transformations between symbolic expressions. It is a version of that in which, rather than having symbolic expressions that mean something, that have actual uh, pieces in them that mean operations like addition or whatever else. It is just the pure bureaucratic structure, in a sense, of the symbolic expressions. And then we are purely manipulating that. And the amazing thing is that we are managing to reproduce physics 
by essentially purely reproducing that essentially content removed version of the pure structure of symbolic expressions, but symbolic expressions in the bulk. And by that, I mean the following. I mean, when we think about programs or even the data that we're manipulating in programs, we're like every piece of the program, every piece of data, it means something to us. It's a, it's a, it's a thing which has a, a definite uh, meaningful identity to us. And there aren't, you know, in a program, there aren't that many of them. We might have 50 million lines of code, but it's still not that big at some level. Whereas what we're thinking about in physics is the same infrastructure, but really in the bulk, in the sense that what we're dealing with is having, uh, you know, 10 to the 100 of these uh, relations, which, uh, which are like symbolic expression structures, but none of them has a name, so to speak. They're all just things that exist in the low-level machine code of the universe, so to speak. In category theory, it's had sort of the same situation. When we talk about um, objects and categories, morphisms, things like that, every morphism is somebody's personal friend, so to speak. Every, you know, it actually means something. It's supposed to have, it's like an addition. It's like a, it, it's something which has a, a, an immediate semantic connotation. Whereas sort of the analogy to what we're doing in physics is just take the infrastructure of category theory and take it in bulk. So instead of having some, some you know, exact sequence of this is and that's that has you know, five elements in it. It's like, no, let's have one with 10 to the 100 elements, but none of those elements are anybody's personal friend, so to speak. They're just being dealt with in the bulk. And so I don't really know how that plays out for category theory, but that's, um, that's I think, the type of connection that we would expect to see. Um, okay, so there's a question here from Gonzal, can't really read it. Each asymmetry corresponds to a creation of destruction of energy. Don't quite understand that. Um, yeah, question here from William. Don't remember if he answers, but what do the directions of the directed edges in the spatial hypergraph represent? Um, surprisingly little, actually. They're really just bookkeeping. They're really just saying, uh, in fact, even in the, the technical document that I wrote uh, uh, sort of launching this project, I talked about the case of undirected hypergraphs. And you could have undirected hypergraphs as well. It's really one of the features of this project is what we're trying to find is the right low level language to describe physics. But we're well aware of the fact that essentially any language we have will be computation universal and will be capable of describing other languages. So saying we're going to do everything in terms of these uh, directed hypergraphs, great. Okay, they can emulate undirected hypergraphs. Similarly, undirected hypergraphs can emulate directed hypergraphs. The question really is, in what formalism is it easiest for us to kind of grok what the universe is doing? And so it's a pure speculation that these directed hypergraphs are, are the right thing, that it will be somewhat, but, but nevertheless, as I was mentioning before, one of the remarkable things is that these sort of these meta levels, these levels above the low level machine code, it actually doesn't even matter what these microscopic details are. In much the same way as, you know, when you look at properties of a, a continuum fluid or something, doesn't matter if it's air or water, the same differential equations are obeyed, even though the detailed molecules at the lowest level are completely different. And so, so it's, uh, it's really a question of convenience. What is the, what programming language do we want to write in to think about the universe? And the one that we are sort of have found most convenient is this one in terms of directed hypergraphs. Um, whether that is ultimately the, the best one is not, is not clear. Uh, the good news is we have something. We have a language that we're taking a good distance and we're able to see its higher level consequences, which as I say, don't depend on the details of that low level language. So the answer is we don't know a, a, a very specific uh, sort of physical um, uh, representation of that. Because I think the physics we're seeing is far above that low level machine code, so to speak. Uh, let's see. Uh, would we consider a constant oscillation of the entire universe? Hmm. Um, we don't have a lot to say about that yet. I mean, in other words, if there's a big bang at the beginning of the universe, might there be a big, big crunch? That's not what the observations tend to say will happen in our universe, but maybe that will change. And there'll be a big crunch where the whole thing comes back down in sort of a time reverse 
Big Bang and they may, maybe oscillate, but we don't know if that's how things will work. Um, so Big Bang, black hole model in space time. So, so the Big Bang is more like a, uh, it's more like a white hole. It's a different kind of, um, of singularity in, in, in space time. Um, well, it, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a singularity, just like inside a black hole, certain kinds of black holes will have space-like singularities where essentially time comes to an end. In our models, that's a very direct thing. You basically have these rewrite rules and at some point, the rewrite rules just don't apply anymore. And that means that time, which is sort of the inexorable, um, uh, uh, inexorable kind of um, uh, development of, um, uh, of the system just comes to an end because there's no rule to apply. Um, and th the inverse of that is what's happening at the beginning of the universe. At the beginning of the universe, you've got no rule is applying and then, then there's a, a first step and then the rule starts applying and that's kind of like the time reversed version of a space like singularity. Uh, something like a white hole. And I see that Jonathan is commenting um, that we discovered some oscillating universes. Yes, uh, the, okay, so at a toy level, we absolutely can find oscillating universes. Uh, you know, since we don't have a, a full model for the whole universe, we can't discuss that. But if it's a question of, you know, just getting a, an intuition for how oscillation in the universe might work, yes, you absolutely can do that with our, with our models. Um, how would increase of energy be represented in the model? Energy is very straightforwardly the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. Otherwise, you can otherwise say that a little bit less precisely as energy is the continual activity in the network. It is the continual process of rewriting. The causal edges are generated every time there's a rewrite. And so to say that at, with time, with the progression of evolution of the system, when there is progressive evolution, when there is progressive activity, that activity corresponds to energy. So it is perfectly possible that there is progressively more activity in the universe, um, and that is sort of an expansion of the universe in physical space. Now, a thing that is interesting to think about is what about the expansion of the universe in branchial space? Uh, we can think about an expansion of the, of the underlying spatial hypergraph, but we can also think about an expansion of the multiway graph uh, in which the transversals are the branchial uh, graphs that correspond to essentially the, the progression of, of generation of more and more quantum states. And the speculation that, that we are beginning to have is that quantum computers will only officially work insofar as the universe is expanding in branchial space. So let me, let me pull that back to something slightly, you know, people say energy is conserved in the universe, all good, okay, well, is that really true? Because when we look at the expansion of the universe, there's this Hubble flow of, of galaxies expanding, potentially with dark energy expanding at an increasing rate. And if we say, what's the energy budget of the universe? Well, actually, it might not be conserved. But that is something that's happening at a very large scale. It's not happening at the scale of, of things like on Earth, where everything is gravitationally bound and so on. But when you look at general relativity and you ask, What's the energy budget of the whole universe? It's not conserved. And so you might say, well, gosh, we could make some special kind of mechanical device that just takes energy from the vacuum by, by leveraging. It's kind of like a tidal, uh, not quite, but it's kind of like, well, like hydroelectric power or something where there's this flow of a river all the time and you're, and you're making use of that. Let's, let's make hydroelectric, the analog of hydroelectric power just mining energy from the expansion of the universe. And yeah, you could do that. According to, uh, um, according to standard general relativity, that would work. It's a tiny effect. It's not gonna get you very far, but in principle, it would work. So when you do quantum computing, one of the things I'll talk about this a little bit more detail in a, in a few moments, um, is that I think one of the emerging possibilities is that actually quantum computing only works insofar as you're essentially mining the, the expansion of the universe in broad shield space. Now, it might be more useful than trying to mine the expansion of the universe in physical space because the universe may be expanding much faster in branch hill space than it is in physical space. But I'm kind of thinking that's, that's the kind of connection that will happen. And by the way, we'll talk later about the deeply abstract question of the expansion of the universe in ruleal space in the space of all possible uh, rule applications. Um, but that's, uh, that's a, a good mind-bending uh, exercise to think about that. And even... I'll just as a preview to think about what is a particle in real space. 
Um, and that's, that's for Jonathan, among others, for, to keep him entertained here. Um, okay, question from Mark. Uh, not quite getting that. Okay, there's a question from Allison here. Have you thought more about the idea of curvature in rural space? What would it mean, deviation between rules? I was just thinking about this last night. Um, I will tell you a little bit about what I think I figured out. Uh, let me, but let me, uh, let me set some stage in terms of what, what happens in rural space first. But that's a very good question, very interesting question. Um, I think I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to say that um, um, I think that the analog of the uncertainty principle in rural space is, a, is, the, um, uh, is the temporary failure of inductive inference. So here's my current speculation, okay? So if you're trying to figure out what rule in your description language, at your position in rural space, what rule describes the universe? Well, the way you do that is by inductive inference. You would say, let me observe pieces of the universe and let me reverse engineer what rule must be being applied to get those, uh, those features of the behavior of the universe. Okay, so that's what we would be doing in traditional natural science is that kind of inductive inference from what we observe in the universe, what rules make that come to be. Okay, so I think that in rural space, we're looking at these sort of local areas where different possible rules are doing very similar things. They're just diverging just a little bit. They lead to universes which are very similar locally. And so my speculation is that the analog of the uncertainty principle is the, uh, the fact that if you want to determine the rule of the universe, that is, if you want to determine your precise position in real space, then it will take a certain irreducible amount of time to do that, and that there will be an uncertainty relation that relates the accuracy with which you can determine your position in real space, how accurately you can inductively infer what the universe, what the rule of the universe is with how long you spend doing it. That's, that's my guess. Now, you might ask the question, um, and, and so then, uh, okay, the fun thing, this is last night's efforts, is to estimate this parameter rho, which is the analog of the speed of light in real space. Well, it's the analog of what, what's in, in physical space would be the speed of light, what in branchial space is related to Planck's constant, quantum constant, um, in, in, um, and, and related to our maximum entanglement speed. There's a similar thing in real space, and I was trying to make some estimates of its size, which I can talk about later. But that's a really good question, Alison. Uh, um, how do we understand from Benjamin, how do we understand the Big Bang in the perspective of our theory? Well, the, the beginning of the universe is just the fact that you have some spatial hypergraph and there are rules that start being applied to that spatial hypergraph. And those rules will lead to typically the increase in size of the spatial hypergraph. That's the simple version of it. Uh, then there's a question of what is the effective dimension of that spatial hypergraph? Maybe it's infinity. Um, as the universe sort of cools, the universe potentially sort of cools down in dimension so that the effective dimension of the spatial hypergraph converges to something like, like three today. Now, actually, I wrote a bulletin about uh, black holes in our, uh, and event horizons in our universes. And um, I had a way of computing uh, kind of the, the causal connections between different parts of the universe. So for example, when there's a black hole, things outside the black hole can affect things inside the black hole, but things inside the black hole can't affect things outside the black hole. So you're essentially dividing the universe into these separate sort of causal domains uh, where one thing can affect another or, or not. And there's also the notion of a sort of cosmic event horizon where there might be uh, parts of the universe which fundamentally are causally disconnected. They can't affect each other. Okay, so I had a way of computing that and Max pointed out that my way of computing it was a bit inadequate, so I have to update my bulletin. And actually, the, um, uh, one of the updates gives us a little bit more information about causal connections in the early universe. It gives us a different way of seeing how there can be uh, not a sort of fully contained, not one causal domain as a subset of another causal domain, but there are partially overlapping causal domains. And I think that's gonna be relevant to understanding things about the early universe. 
and uh, that will be hopefully an update to that bulletin uh, real soon. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, another question from Allison. The analog of Einstein's equations in real space. These are great questions. I uh, love these questions. Um, I've been thinking about that. I've got some comments later. Um, I think it has to do with, um, well, let me talk about it later. Um, Okay, minor from Cali. Yeah, minor deviations would be the way uh, branching happens in real space. Yeah, that that's correct. Um, okay, uh, let's see. From Victor, how to understand time in our models? Um, the time in our models is something incredibly fundamental. Time is the inexorable process of computation going on in the universe, and that means time is, in, in many theories, in, in, uh, in standard mathematical physics of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, uh, time is just a coordinate like space. That was something that came out of the theory of relativity and particularly out of the work of Hermann Minkowski around 1909, who said, gosh, we can think about invariant intervals in relativity which have the mathematical form t squared minus x squared minus y squared minus z squared. We can think about that as a quadratic form. He'd studied that in mathematics. He said, let's just say that we have this thing called space time, which is a Lorentzian manifold that has, in which time is just a coordinate like space and it's packaged together in that t squared minus x squared form. Well, I think that was a bad idea um, because I think in fact, time is something very different from space. Time is this inexorable process by which computation follows computation, by which the output from one computation is fed as input to the next computation and so on. Uh, and that is the progress of the universe, is the progress of that inexorable, irreducible computation. One thing that's interesting in our model is that we have physical space laid out in the spatial hypergraph. We have the space of quantum states laid out in Brownshield space. We have a space of possible rules laid out in real space, but that's the sort of space direction. But all of those, in all of those arenas, time is the same thing. There's still the same notion of time. Time is what knits all those things together. They all involve this sort of inexorable process of computation, and that is the progression of time. And so time in our models is, a, is something very, um, uh, it's very fundamental. And it is really time is just computation. Time is measured by the steps of irreducible computation that go by. And in fact, uh, I'll talk about in, in the, the analog of the speed of light in real space is a measure of that, I believe. Uh, let's see. Okay, there's a question from Levgen here. Can it be that the rule set behaves like 2.5 dimensional space since, until a certain large time then becomes three dimensional? Is there mathematical apparatus that puts bounds on this or says it's impossible? That's a really good question. The answer is no, uh, mathematics, we don't know mathematics that tells us about that. We would really, really like to. Basically what you have to do, calculus is set up to talk about things like manifolds. Manifolds are locally like uh, integer dimensional Euclidean space. That is how all of sort of modern calculus, differential geometry, all these kinds of things, they're all built on this idea that locally, everything is like Euclidean space or Lorentzian space, but same, same difference. Integer numbers of dimensions, okay? There is presumably a generalization of calculus that applies to where locally, what happens is not an integer dimensional Euclidean space, but we don't know what that is. Possibly there are ideas from geometric group theory where you're thinking about the limit and as a matter of fact, I have a very concrete example of this in real space, which I just figured out, well, with help from two other people, figured out yesterday um, the, uh, of how, well, almost figured out um, how, so in the Cayley graph of groups, the sort of representation of the relations between elements and groups, um, the limits of those have been studied a bit in geometric group theory, and they potentially might be a model for something like uh, fractional dimensional space and calculus in fractional dimensional space. Um, unfortunately, things where you're just looking at sort of things like fractals, um, uh, there isn't really uh, sort of truly, 
you're still usually thinking about embedding the fractal in an integer dimensional space to do things on the fractal. What we want is something where the fractal is the story, so to speak, where the, where the fractional dimensional space is the whole story of space. And we need to build a calculus on that. And we just don't know how to do that yet. And it's a super interesting question in mathematics. It'll generate some very elegant and very important mathematics, I think, but we don't know how that works yet. Um, okay, there's a question from Planumbra here. If gravity can be described as curvature of space by mass, might electric charge analogously be described as curvature in a higher dimensional space? Uh, and does our physics model uh, model the mass-induced curvature of space? So first point, the mass-induced curvature of space, absolutely. We can derive Einstein's equations involving the energy momentum tensor. Essentially what's happening is that the presence of causal edges, which is what energy is, is causing geodesics that are propagating um, in, uh, to, in the causal graph to be uh, sort of to be diverted by to be deflected by the presence of uh, lots of causal edges in the causal graph. That's, that's roughly, that's sort of the qualitative version of why Einstein's equations work. Okay, what is electric charge? Well, we don't know yet. And actually your idea is related a bit to the Kaluza-Klein theories that were popular from the 1930s on that sort of imagined that maybe uh, there's sort of a five dimensional space and maybe, maybe one could do something like that that didn't work out at that time. And it's an interesting question, which we have not looked at, and it's a good question, whether there is a way to think about Kaluza-Klein type theory in the context of our, uh, our hypergraphs. I don't know. Good question. Um, I think that um, um, the possibility, yeah, I simply don't know. I think what we know so far is that, and we haven't really looked at this more than we did at the time of launch, the way that local gauge invariance works. So, so local gauge invariance is sort of the way to understand electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is associated with a sort of a, a, an arbitrariness in the way that you can assign a phase, a U1 phase to different points in space. And there is a connection between the, the how you apply those phases and that connection represents the electromagnetic field uh, or the vector potential of electromagnetism. Um, and uh, so it's essentially the electromagnetic field is the knitting together. It describes how you knit together this sort of arbitrary choice of, uh, of, of orientation in this internal space that's represented by this U1 gauge group. And so we have a very, very analogous thing because we have an internal degree of freedom that has to do with the way that a rule gets applied. There may be many ways that a rule can be applied within our spatial hypergraph. And so it's a question of that internal degree of freedom. First of all, does, is there a limit in which those internal, uh, uns, uh, the internal ambiguities limit to something like a Lie group? That's question one. And question two, when we have those local ambiguities, how does that propagate through um, to, uh, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the more global system? And I think it's, okay, so, so roughly when we look at the spatial hypergraph, we can say that the limit of the spatial hypergraph is something like a manifold, at least in certain cases. We can understand how that limiting process works. It's the, our guess that the limit of this ambiguity in the way that rules can get applied, the limit of that can be a Lie group, which is essentially a, a continuous version of a group, just like a manifold is a continuous version of a description of space. So a Lie group is a continuous version of what would otherwise be a discrete set of elements that correspond to a group. And uh, so I, I looked a little bit at the, uh, in the technical document that, I, I, uh, uh, that we uh, put out at the time when we launched the project, I looked a little bit at how that limiting process, limiting two Lie groups might work from essentially bundles of permutations that get bundles of discrete permutations limiting to Lie groups. It's sort of an interesting question how that works. And actually it occurs to me that the things I've just been doing in Rulial space might have some bearing on this. Let's see, a comment from Jonathan here that, um, okay, so he's speculating that the foliation of the multi-way system might be thought of as a Kaluza-Klein-like reduction from a higher dimensional space to ordinary space-time. Uh, that's interesting. I mean, uh, boy, that's um, so, uh, I mean, I understand that idea. Um, uh, I think, gosh. Um, 
um, you know, that reduction from, I, I, okay, requires more thought. Um, don't know. All right, let's just try and get through some more of these questions. And then I want to talk a little bit about our understanding of quantum mechanics and a Rulial space. Um, Question from Ed, does category theory give us a framework for knowing when directed hypergraphs are equivalent? I don't particularly think so. I mean, I think it's just hypergraph isomorphism that tells us that. But hypergraph isomorphism is a very complicated business. And in multi-space, there is going to be, see, see what we've been doing so far, is sort of an approximation. We've just been looking at a whole hypergraph and we've been saying the multi-way graph merges when a whole hypergraph, when two whole hypergraphs are isomorphic. But in reality, we want to do something which is a much more local version of that, that will ultimately be equivalent when there's causal invariance and so on, but will look much more interwoven. I mean, it's kind of like saying, I've got a bunch of strings and I could describe them all separately, or I could describe the whole bundle of strings as a, as a regular expression in which I have some, some wild card. So you can think about a string as being character, 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 character. You can think about a regular expression as describing a string by having a graph in which there are multiple paths through that graph. And it's the same kind of thing in multispace that we are thinking about describing not just a single choice for this is the way things are laid out in space, but this kind of set of possibilities. And it's a little bit like a regular expression, but what we have is a, is a big generalization of that. And actually, as I'm thinking about it, there's a question of what is the analog of a regular expression Actually, that's an interesting way to think about it. A, a graph with patterns, so to speak. So a regular expression can be thought of as something where, you know, it's, it's the string C star T or something might be a regular expression, which we see and then any, uh, you know, any sequence of characters in some version of, of how regular expressions work followed by T. Um, and so uh, the, um, you know, there's a question of when we're thinking about, our, this is an interesting idea. When we're thinking about our hypergraphs, can we think about the hypergraphs not just concretely as hypergraphs, but as pattern hypergraphs um, in which there might be sub hypergraphs that can be fed in just like there are sort of sub regular, sub strings that can be fed into a regular expression. That might be a way to get a, a bit more of a handle on multispace. I've been having a hard time understanding how to visualize multispace. I have some, some candidate visualizations, but they look terrible so far. Okay, let's see. Um, there's a question. Any, uh, there's a question about uh, peer review of, of our papers. You know, a bit disappointing there. I mean, after people say, so a lot of people have been reading them. So, I mean, that's the good news. And, and I know that because there are, you know, mis small mistakes that have been pointed out and we've been fixing those and so on. And I would say there's a, there's a high degree of, of actual reading in detail which is very encouraging, both I think of my, my documents and of Jonathan's papers. Um, I think that the, uh, we put up a kind of peer review infrastructure um, because people said, we want peer review. Well, so far I cannot report great success there. Uh, you know, if, you, if everybody wants peer review, somebody has got to do the peer review and uh, encourage everybody to do that. Uh, we think we have a pretty good infrastructure for it. Um, but uh, 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 so far, nobody's gone to that effort. I think I'm hoping maybe at our summer school that we'll be able to um, encourage some people to, to, to write some, uh, you know, I, I think the thing to realize is what we think is useful about peer review is somebody saying, look, I read this, I understand it, it seems to make sense. Not the whole thing. The whole thing is a great big thing to talk about, but just, you know, say section 5.6, I understand section 5.6. Here are a few comments about what, you know, to review section 5.6. Here's what some other things to help one understand section 5.6, so to speak. I just don't think it's, it's um, uh, you know, I, I'm, and maybe we haven't presented sort of, I, I thought we made it very clear that that's the kind of peer review that we think will be useful. But uh, so far, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I believe no takers, which is disappointing. I mean, it, it's one of these things where, uh, I could could expound on that at length, but I, uh, you know, the, the most important thing is people are reading things, people are understanding things, people are giving feedback about things. That's what's important, and that's what's going to help move this forward and and move science forward in general. Um, 
Okay, is the theory compatible with Marx's principle? I'm not sure. Maybe Jonathan has a comment on that. Uh, Marx's principle is a, is a slippery creature. Um, but uh, Jonathan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. So the, the best, the most well-defined formulation of Marx's principle that I'm at least aware of is the one by Dennis Schama. And the, the, the basic idea is that you can use the fixed masses of the universe to define a globally stationary uh, rotational frame, uh, you know, against which all, all, all rotations are effectively measured. Um, so it's worth saying, and Stephen probably has a crisper exposition of this than I do, but the, so the formulation of relativistic angular momentum in our model basically consists of you take the causal network, which is our representation of space time, you define essentially like a cylinder through the causal network, and then you rotate some, some hyperplane through that cylinder, and then you look at the net flux of causal edges through that hyperplane as either summed or averaged over, uh, over all, so all the hyperplanes that, that sort of exist in that cylinder. Um, and that, that, so that gives you some, uh, that gives you a direct way of measuring the uh, sort of the, the, the rate of turning of causal edges in the causal network. Um, so then Marx's principle in, in Sharma's formulation would say that there's some, you know, that, that there's some global cylinder that you can define across the entire causal network in which that sum is equal to zero. Now, of course, there are some causal networks where that's true, where effectively the, the net flux in, in all directions is the same. And there are some causal networks where it's, where it's profoundly not true, where there's some s significant asymmetry in, in the flux of causal edges. Um, and so from our point of view, that's actually quite good because we know that there are valid solutions to the Einstein equations. I mean, the, the famous one being the Gödel metric that, that dramatically violate Max principle. Max principle is something that we kind of only suspect observationally to be true. We have no mathematical reason to suspect that it, you know, that, that it's uh, that it's a, you know, that it's a fundamental feature of our universe. So the fact that our, our, our model supports the existence of cosmologies that are both consistent and not consistent with Max principle, and that we have a way of distinguishing between the two, I think, is is actually quite encouraging. Okay, so let me let me re restate what you said, which I think is is much better version of of. Um, so, I mean, what you're basically saying is with our recent understanding of angular momentum as this kind of vorticity of causal edges, so to speak, that there's a question of how you measure the vorticity of causal edges. Because if there was sort of nothing, it might be said, I don't know if this is really right, we should, we should untangle this a bit. I mean, that if there was nothing in the universe, you couldn't measure the vorticity of causal edges, maybe. Or maybe even if there was nothing, even in these, in these spaces, where there's sort of a net spin of the universe, so to speak, um, that we can see that too. You know what? We're close. We let, let's go figure this one out. We should we should figure out a crisp version of how Marx's principle works because I think now that we understand something about any momentum, we should be able to do that. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, okay. So there's a question: Can the hypergraph evolution behave like 5D space until a certain point? And then become 3D afterwards. Um, is that the same problem as a halting problem? Yes, it could be ensnared in a halting like problem. That is, to know what will be the long term output, long term outcome of one of these computational rules may be irreducibly hard. And, and I thought that was going to happen much more as we tried to work out physics from these models. It's been mercifully uh, possible to work things out without being ensnared in computational irreducibility. But yeah, we, we don't know about this. We, we need this generalization of calculus. Help us, help us make that. Um, okay, so let's see, there's a question from Glitch. Well, if we exist as observers within this hypergraph, does this mean that some hypothetically large computer could run the rule for the universe and foliate until we humans pop out again? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, Oh boy, there's a point comment from Calais here about um, uh, ideas don't move at a constant speed, they seem to have acceleration. And that's a comment I think about Rulial space. And that's an interesting uh, speculation and comment. Uh, let me try and talk a bit more about Rulial space in a few minutes. Um, is there a natural explanation for, is there an explanation for natural randomness in our model? Um, like the, the decay of a radioactive isotope, yeah. I mean, our model, randomness is a feature of computationally irreducible systems. Randomness, what is randomness? Randomness is, I don't know what's going to happen. Randomness is, I can't sort of jump ahead and say, this system is going to do this. It just looks random to me. And that is a sign of computational irreducibility. That's something 
that I've seen in rule 30 that one can kind of see a little bit less exactly in the digits of pi. It's something where um, even though you know the underlying rule, the process of computation generates something which is irreducible where you can't jump ahead, it looks random. So in, in our models, there's randomness all over the place. Not randomness as in just what, how randomness often enters models where you just say, oh, that's something we don't know. It's the throw of a dice. We don't have that. Our model is completely determined. But the f effectively, just like the digits of pi, there is randomness, even though it comes from an underlying rule. But we, particularly as observers within this universe, we can't jump ahead and say, oh, it's not really random because it's going to be the digit seven in a moment. Because we are, uh, it's, it's something where there's irreducible computation going on, which we can't outrun. So it, it seems, quotes, random to us, even though there is this underlying computation. That, that's how that works. Um, okay, question from Glitch. How does ADF-CFT conjecture fit into this theory? It probably fits beautifully, and we just need some string theory people to go nail this down. And I think some people are working on this, and perhaps we'll see some papers in the near future on it. Um, most likely, it's the it's sort of the knitting together of branchial space and, and uh, physical space. It's the fact that the multi-way causal graph has sort of a slicing that corresponds to physical space and a slicing that corresponds to branchial space. That's our guess as to how the ADS-CFT correspondence works. And I think it will be very direct in our models. Um, and we may very well learn some things from some of the detailed work that's been done on ADS-CFT. Uh, how many rules can you apply at the same time to compute the universe? That's a complicated question because the, these rules define the progression of time. So in other words, the, the, these rules are just applied wherever they can be applied. The question of which rules are being applied simultaneously is a question of which foliation you're picking in the causal graph. And, and so that's really just a matter for the observer. These rules are just applying everywhere. But these two rules that applied in two different places, they might be, they're like, well, they just applied separately. It doesn't matter what order they're in. It only matters what order they're in when some causal, when some causal relationship knits those two things together. So that, that's kind of how that, how that works. Um, let's see. Questions here. Let's see. A model describes... Dynamic creation of a graph, could it be equivalent to pre-existing fabric of some sort being deformed in some way? Uh, you know, that's a question of, of what are other ways to describe what's going on? There are undoubtedly many ways to describe what's going on. Uh, the question is, are they useful? Is it a useful language? I don't know. Uh, there's a question from Glitch, any word from Lee Smolin? Uh, actually, I have not heard from him. I sent him email and he hasn't sent me a response now that, now that you mention it. So I, I, I can say nothing. I, so people who've worked on loop quantum gravity have, uh, have indeed been, been corresponding with us and, and uh, we may try and do a live stream with some of those folks at some point. I think, I think we've discovered that a lot of academic scientists are afraid of live streams. So we need to kind of find some way to, uh, we, what we may do is have some discussions which are recorded but not live streamed, which is kind of a shame because I think it's fun for everybody to live stream these things. And um, I, I um, uh, I've enjoyed the, the live stream discussions that we've been doing to date. Um, I think um, uh, we've really been hoping to, to chat with Roger Penrose, um, uh, but he seems to be having some health problems right now, which hopefully will resolve swiftly. Um, and uh, uh, I think um, we'll, we'll, um, uh, we'll, be, um, uh, we'll be, it will be interesting to, um, uh, to chat about lots of kinds of things there. Let's see, is there time slippage like clocks in a CPU? Well, I'm not sure what time slippage you mean there, but there's certainly time dilation. And in fact, you will see, when I finally get to talk about rule real space, you will see time dilation in Turing machines, which is quite fun. And you'll see relativistic, the analog of relativistic time dilation in Turing machines. Um, okay, so question from Dale. Have we found applications of Ramsey theory, ergodic theory, and measure theory to this? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, measure theory, for sure. There are all kinds of interesting measure theoretic questions, particularly about the multi-way graph. Uh, they are probably beyond my personal level of measure theory knowledge, 
Um, but there's super interesting things to be done there. I mean, this is a, you know, what we're dealing with is these transverse measures in with respect to something like a flow that corresponds to the actual evolution process. A Godic theory, um, well, there's a lot of kind of uh, ergodicity like things going on. We don't so much think about ensembles. We might think about ensembles. It might be useful to think in terms of ensembles. We haven't really been doing that very much. But what we, what we certainly do need is certain results that say that our statistical averages are consistent with the averages of ensembles. We haven't really poked in that direction very much. I have to say I was a little bit put off because when I looked at cellular automaton fluid dynamics in the 1980s, where some of the same issues of deriving continuum equations from underlying discrete dynamics existed, it was just far away from what you could prove with anything in ergodic theory that, um, that the specific sort of irreducible computations would lead to ergodicity. But it's worth, it's worth looking at. It'd be a good thing to look at. And there's some questions about ergodicity that you could look at in the space of hypergraphs um, even pretty much immediately. And I, it's, a, it's a complicated thing because when you have like a cellular automaton, the space of states is pretty well defined. It's just possible sequences of bits. In the case of hypergraphs, even the space of states is hard to define. And if you say how many hypergraphs with n nodes are there, even that is not an easy thing to answer. Um, so ergodic theory is a little bit more complicated when the space that you're dealing with is a space of hypergraphs. Actually, you're making me think that in Rulial space, which I'll finally talk about soon, there are some ergodic theory questions that come up, which will actually come up for Turing machines. Let's talk about that later. Okay, Ramsey theory. You're asking about Ramsey theory. Um, the uh, um, directly, no, uh, but doesn't mean that they don't exist. A thing that is sort of an emerging interest is the relationship of transfinite numbers to and things like Goodstein sequences and so on, which sort of back onto Ramsey theory, uh, possibly in ways I don't well understand yet. Um, but I think that the transfinite numbers uh, actually looks like very nice applications of transfinite numbers to understand the essentially uh, infinite time limit of a multiway system, that you may be able to characterize the infinite time limit of a multiway system in terms of transfinite numbers characterizing its state effectively. Um, again, we don't know that yet. And sort of the comparison between, um, uh, um, between these things. Okay, there's a comment from Jonathan, which he's going to have to explain on camera here, saying Ramsey theory might be related to particle creation in the early universe. Oh, I think I see what, what Jonathan is thinking of. So, so that w there may be properties of certain hypergraph rules that, that say once, once the hypergraph reaches a certain size, some topological obstructions will be inevitable and that that will be a purely Ramsey theoretic result and that that may or may not have relevance to, to sort of particle That's creation. That's a cool idea. Right, so to, to explain that, I mean, Ramsey theory is, is, a, is a theory about, for example, graphs. Any sufficiently large graph has to contain certain kinds of subgraphs um, just by... It, it is an inevitable feature. Same thing for certain arithmetic sequences. We have enough numbers, there'll always be uh, a, an arithmetic sequence defined a certain way. There's a nice example of Ramsey theory in, in my in notes and new kind of science book. Um, but in any case, so what Jonathan is suggesting is that in any sufficiently large hypergraph, there will necessarily be certain subgraphs that might correspond to particles, just as you might say, it isn't true, that in any sufficiently large graph. So uh, there's a characterization of non-planarity in graphs, the, uh, the Kuratowski's theorem, for example. And you might say, though it isn't true, that any sufficiently large graph must con contain, merely as a matter of Ramsey theory, a subgraph that, that represents non-planarity. Non That's not true for non-planarity, but maybe it is true in hypergraphs for something that corresponds to the topological obstruction that represents the presence of a particle. That would be, that's very interesting, good idea. Uh, don't forget that idea, it's a good idea. Um, okay, question. I don't know what, there's a Rick here talking about, his model deals with underlying primitive space, I, I don't know. The, you know, one of the challenges here is people send us a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of, of their models of things. And, you know, the fact is, in my life, I'm gonna get the chance probably to explore one model of fundamental physics. And uh, you know, I, this one, I kind of started on 30 years ago and we've only finally gotten to the, to the kind of point we're at right now. It's a hard job exploring fundamental theories of physics. And um, uh, so 
you know, it's uh, when somebody sends me something that says, I've got a theory of physics too, um, the main, uh, you know, the main thing I have to say is, well, great. You know, it's like, go explore it, you know, by all means. I, I would say that, that I have a couple of caveats to make. Uh, one thing I would say is, you know, to have a chance of reproducing physics as we know it, you kind of have to connect to the big theories of 20th century physics, quantum field theory and general relativity. These are, because those theories are already, you know, a million miles above sort of basic high school physics, so to speak. They have aggregated together just gazillions of phenomena that would be treated as separate, that wouldn't even be described in sort of high school or college level physics. They're, they're sort of the, the, the great aggregators. And in a sense, they are what, you know, if you can get those, you've got everything, or you've, you've got, you know, that's a, not everything, but you've got a big, you've got a big, you, you, you've got everything we currently know in physics, um, if you can get those theories. The problem is those theories are complicated. Those theories are abstract. They rely on towers of mathematics that are, are not, you know, basically it's like many years of physics school, so to speak, to get to the point where you're dealing with the mathematics of quantum field theory, mathematics of general relativity. You know, I was sort of lucky in my own life that I happened to start doing those things when I was a kid. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of known those uh, mathematical structures for a very, very long time. And, but they're, they're complicated structures. And, and I wouldn't know them if I hadn't really actually worked in computing things in them. You know, it's been funny as I've been coming back to doing physics here, I have only realized in the last few weeks how comparatively rusty I was. I'm, I'm finally getting back in the groove here. I mean, I think I'm not, not totally shabby, even when I was a bit rusty, but I'm finally getting back in the groove of really, really um, uh, knowing sort of uh, uh, in a very agile way, um, the, um, all these different things. Now, of course, it's a strange experience for me because it's like, a, you know, I've been a, away for 40 years and I come back and a few things have changed. And I, one of the ones that's sort of amusing is people have been asking about this thing that they call the Born Rule in quantum mechanics. And I was sort of rather confused because I'm like, well, the, you know, I know Born had certain things that he computed about transition amplitudes and all this kind of thing, but, but I didn't know what, I, I didn't, I, you know, I sort of assumed this was, I kind of guessed what they must mean, but I didn't know for sure. Well, it turns out the Born rule is just the statement of the probability is the, is the modulus squared of the, of the, of the uh, amplitude. But um, when I was doing quantum mechanics, people didn't call it that. It was just, I don't think that really had a name, that result. Um, it was just how you compute the probability. Maybe some people talked about it as the Copenhagen interpretation, things like that, which is kind of a mis mis mistaken, uh, you know, uh, conflation of terms, but it doesn't really matter. But anyway, what I realized only quite recently is that in the last decade, with the rise of quantum information, the the notion of the Born rule, which came out of, uh, of uh, which was described that way in von Neumann's mathematical work on quantum mechanics, that has become the name for that idea. Um, but that's a recent name. I mean, the idea existed from the 1920s, and I certainly understood that idea very well in the 1970s. But um, it only sort of, uh, it only got that name. It kind of reminds me of when I look at sort of uh, elementary school math textbooks and they have names for mathematical operations. And it's like, I have never heard of this. I've been doing math all my life and I've never heard of this name of, you know, carry forward, uh, you know, something or others. And I realized that sort of something that's emerged in the kind of uh, meta description of mathematical education but it wasn't part of the canon of, of actually doing it. But anyway, so you know, back to, to sort of other people's theories. You know, I think the, um, uh, it will be the case that there are people who, who've developed, who've worked on sort of sophisticated, mathematically oriented theories that connect, that are typically, honestly, in the, in the professional physics and mathematics domain, um, the, uh, um, that, you know, relate to, you know, twister theory, relate to whatever else. These are things which I fully expect to have, have, have gotten enough mileage within those theories themselves that they will be useful in understanding things for our theory. Uh, when it comes to uh, kind of, I've got a theory and it's kind of based on high school physics, it's really not very promising because you are short cutting, you're, you're, you're kind of jumping over, you're ignoring 20th century physics and you kind of need that to know whether you have a theory that makes any sense. Now, you know, having said all of that, I will say that 
that I personally consider people say, will you help me with my theory? And the answer is, well, no, because you know, I only get one shot in my life probably to work on a theory like this. And I, I almost got zero shots in my life to work on a theory like this. And you know, I'm going to, my theory is going really well, thank you. And I'm, that's what I'm gonna keep pursuing. And I think that um, the, uh, uh, the question, however, I will say something. If you say, well, you know, that's not very nice. You should be contributing to other people's theories. I would like to point out that I've spent about 40 years of my life doing exactly that building tools that are basically the tools that get used by most you know, theoretical physicists, people like that, to explore theories. Uh, and you know, that I, I've sort of built the upstream tools. Uh, I've led the building, we have a large team that, that works on these things, the, the building of, of Wolfram language, Mathematica and so on, which are the upstream tools that people should use. And again, if you're not using those tools, you've just you know, kind of, you know, if, if you're, it's like you don't use 20th century physics, huge handicap. Don't use the tools we built to do sort of the things you need to do in, in working out theories, big handicap. So, but, you know, as I say, my, my major contribution to everybody else's theory, which is what I've been mostly doing before I started working on this, this, uh, uh, this physics again, is we built a bunch of tools and uh, those tools, I think, are the world's, you know, have been for the last several decades, the primary tools used for exploring these kinds of fundamental uh, physics ideas. And um, so that's one thing to say. Now, I, I think I, I'll just make one comment about kind of the, um, uh, the sort of the, the I've got a theory two type, um, type, uh, type situation. I mean, I think a lot of people, I've been very surprised at how many, you know, literally, probably hundreds now of, uh, of people sending us things about various different theories. And, you know, I, I kind of, my, my instinct is, uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm like, I'd like to, to suggest something, do something, but you know, it's like, I, I had the experience actually, that's a funny story. I had the experience when I was, what was it? 15 years old, maybe. I was, I was starting to do physics. I published physics paper or so. And um, somehow, person in England, uh, the um, um, a person um, uh, who had some some theory of physics got my address and sent me this letter about you know I've got this theory of physics, and it was a theory about how there were I don't know loops of wire that corresponded to electrons and things like this. Okay, so. I, you know, was just a naive 15 year old and I'm like, this theory is obviously wrong. You know, I can perfectly well see, you know, if you, if you look at how quantum electrodynamics works and you look at this whole big bucket of experiments that have been done, this theory is just obviously wrong and, you know, couldn't possibly be correct. So, so I wrote back to this person and I said, look, um, you know, that's all well and good, but there are these, you know, these experiments show this theory can't be correct. So I then got this whole deluge of letters and it was all a rather, rather unfortunate situation. And that kind of, that kind of put me off for, um, oh gosh, what is it now? That was 1975. So, so a solid um, uh, 45 years um, put me off kind of responding to these kinds of things, except in the case of kids. Kids are different. I, I've, that, that's been a different story. Um, but um, uh, and actually, I'll, I'll tell you a, a one very bizarre thing, and, and I'm getting off topic here, and I'm just telling stories, but I'll tell you this one because it's kind of, a, kind of interesting. I actually found recently an envelope, which was a letter I was intending to send that person back in 1975 that I didn't send for some reason or another. It was sort of my, my final iteration in this, in this exchange. And I was like, what am I going to do with this letter? It's from 1975. It's to a person who I remember in his first... Um, uh, sort of introductory uh, letter describing himself. He, he described himself as, as um, uh, I think he said, I don't remember the exact age, but you know, I'm, I am a well-preserved 62 year old or so, something like that. And, and to me at age 15, that seemed like an impossibly, unbelievably ancient uh, kind of age, but of course it doesn't seem quite so ancient anymore. Um, but uh, uh, in any case, I, I'm, um, uh, I was, I, we did do some research to try and figure out whether we could track down at least uh, descendants of the person to whom I'd been intending to send this letter in 1975, but without luck. Okay, 
that was a very long answer to a, to a comment there. Um, question about the quantum eraser experiment. And this is one where I'm, I'm well, either have to, I, I would like to actually get on and talk about some of these other things. So let me just, um, um, Okay, there's a question from Dale here. How do I think this project might change the academic community for lay people? And does this represent sort of a democratization of scholarship? That's a really good question. I think the answer to that will depend on to what extent non-academics really make big contributions to this project. And I know people are starting and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. And I think what you'll see there, I suspect, I, I might be wrong, but I suspect there will be some very practical contributions. I know people are working on this right now from a sort of computational point of view, uh, parallelizing code, making things work in virtual reality for visualization, those kinds of things that don't require a big stack of kind of mathematical physics knowledge. There may be some insights that come from people without that big stack of mathematical physics uh, knowledge, maybe some very, very interesting insights. I mean, I don't, I certainly consider it not impossible. I don't know, something like the understanding of multispace no idea whether that's going to be usefully informed by a big stack of mathematical physics knowledge or whether it's just like a good idea um, that needs to be had. Don't know. So that could come from sort of the non sort of academic professional people. I think that a community that we're seeing is people who have been educated in sort of the traditional canon of mathematical physics, but who for one reason or another, they're software engineers now or something else and this is kind of a hobby activity, uh, I suspect there will be some really big contributions from people like that. Um, and I think that that uh, is interesting because it represents you know, the value system of academia, which is like published papers, you know, do, um, um, it rewards certain kinds of things, which I don't think are optimal for the progression of science. Um, I think that, uh, you know, for example, one of the things we've been doing, well, I haven't written enough of these yet with these bulletins, um, you know, journal articles these days have a habit, to my mind, of being extremely boring and extremely incremental. Not always, but, but a lot of them are. Um, and they're very much like I am putting down one little step in a long progression, and I'm not really explaining why I'm doing this. I'm just saying, you know, recently Smith and Jones did this, so I'm going to take another step in that direction. And it's pretty boring. And unless you know in detail what Smith and Jones did, you're kind of up a creek in terms of knowing what this paper is talking about. Back in the day, you know, when journals were first invented in the 1600s, people were much chattier. You read what they said and it's like, oh, you know, I, I found this kind of strange animal living in a whatever and they have a kind of a chat about it. So in the bulletins that we're writing, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm purposefully, you know, there's a certain amount of chattiness. They have a lot of detailed technical content, but they're also kind of chatty. And that gives one a reason, a way of explaining the motivations for things, which I think will make things more accessible. I hope it will. Um, so I think it's sort of, uh, um, now in terms of, of the kind of, um, you know, you have to remember what academia is. In a sense, you know, academia is a lot about universities and, the, the, you know, what a university is about. Their long time mission from the 1200s, so to speak, was sort of the, the passing on of scholarship from generation to generation. In my opinion, a very important thing to do. I, sometimes universities lose track of that, that motivation and say, oh, that stuff from, from the past, that's all irrelevant, we don't need to pass it on. I think that's a mistake. I think we have this sort of unbroken chain of knowledge for a long time and it's really important to pass that on. But you know, universities sort of in the last, I don't know, 50, 60 years, really became these places where sort of a lot of, in, in most countries, not all countries, it doesn't work this way in all countries, are the places where research happens. The fact that those two things are bundled together is complicated and has led to sort of complicated dynamics. Back, back when I was uh, a professor, okay, a shocking thing that I will admit to is, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, it's like you're a professor. So you do, you know, you give classes. And I realized I, at some point I signed up to give a physics for non-scientists uh, class. I thought it'd be kind of interesting. Um, and I realized, oh my gosh, I have no idea what to do in an undergraduate class because I've never gone to one myself. I, I went, for various reasons, I went to Oxford where I didn't need to go to classes and didn't go to classes and things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm in this undergraduate class and I, I don't know what to do. 
and, and that's sort of a mechanism of, of professoring. That was, that was a while ago, that was in the mid, eight, mid 1980s. So maybe things have changed, but, but it was sort of shocking that, you know, I was, I was hired as a professor because I, you know, was doing research that was interesting, but nobody ever bothered to say, by the way, have you ever taught a course ever? Well, I've taught graduate, I taught graduate courses, but they're a different story. So, so you know, I'm, I'm a good example of a bad example, so to speak, of, of that. I think my class was kind of interesting in the end. Um, okay, let's, let's um, I, I really want to get to talking about, um, uh, okay, there's a question, how much of nothing is there in the universe? That's interesting questions. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, there's a question from Dale here. Interesting thought experiment to apply your idea of the universe's graph growing to surreal numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, thinking about it. Go think about it. I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's growing the surreal numbers. Interesting question. Um, uh, let's see. There's a question from Ollie about, will we be able to see matter? Absolutely. We have matter both in bulk and potentially for particles. Um, the, uh, okay. Oh boy, so many questions here. So many interesting questions. This is, this is terrible. Um, oh, that's an interesting thing from Sean here. I just noticed, why did John von Neumann say he started to not believe in Hilbert space? Didn't know he'd said that. Um, okay, a question from Andrew. In your theory, does quantum entanglement have a limit within physical space? That is an interesting question. I mean, that relates to the multi-way causal graph. Uh, we're mostly, quantum entanglement has a maximum speed of, of how many states are getting entangled. Um, the, uh, all right, listen, let, let, me, um, let, let me skip. I, I'm gonna try and come back to some of these questions, but let me, um, let me skip ahead and just say a few things I wanted to say about quantum mechanics and about rule space. Okay, quantum mechanics. All right, so this is, uh, sort of our, our emerging understanding of quantum mechanics, okay? So first question is, um, okay, quantum mechanics, usually described in terms of quantum amplitudes. Quantum amplitude is, uh, you know, you talk about a state and you talk about, you know, you represent it as a sum of basis states, there's an amplitude for each of those states and so on. They're all complex numbers, okay? So one of the things that we are pretty sure of is that the packaging of quantum amplitudes into complex numbers is misleading. And that in fact, you should be thinking about separately the magnitude of the, of the number of the amplitude and the phase of the amplitude. And roughly the way that comes about in our models is the magnitude has to do with essentially path counting. But it's saying in the multi-way graph, you're going to reach a certain state and what, um, and, and how many paths in the multi-way graph, how many different kinds of rewritings can get you to that same state? And that's what determines the magnitude of the quantum amplitude. Now, what determines the phase? Well, the phase, we think, is corresponding to the position in branchial space that that amplitude is, that that state is at. That is the amplitude of the state is, it's, it's how much it was fed by paths in the multi-way graph, and then its phase is where it is in the branchial graph. So, so in other words, uh, unitarity, the sort of conservation of probability is sort of inevitable by the, when you're dealing with this path counting idea, but then phase is determined by, the, there's a separate piece, which is the phase of the amplitude. Okay, so in the path integral, um, my friend Dick Feynman's path integral formulation of, of quantum mechanics, the, um, uh, the kind of, approach there is to say, what you do is you look at this, this bundle of paths in our interpretation propagating through the multi-way graph. And you're asking, the, the path integral tells you that the phase associated with one of those paths is e to the i s over h bar, where s is the action. And so in our model, that phase represents this turning of the geodesic which determines where it lands in branchial space. And it's kind of interesting that the path integral is just a phase. And the, and the measure is what gives you 
you know, then there's, there's a measure there and that measure corresponds to our counting of paths type thing. So, and the phase is essentially the way to think about that phase is it's a turning of GD6. That, that phase represents the turning of GD6, turning as in uh, changing your position in branchial space. So we don't fully understand how this works. We don't fully understand branchial space. It's probably some kind of projective Hilbert space in some continuum limit. Don't fully understand that. Um, but this is sort of the picture of what's going on. And we can sort of mathematically do things even without really knowing what branchial space is really like. But so, so first statement is, you know, really separate these two things. Okay, so the next issue is the Born rule that I just mentioned to you, the concept that, oh, actually here's a, here's a question. So how does interference work? How can it be the case that there are two paths and they end up saying that there are two paths that contribute to something. One of the mysteries of quantum mechanics is there are two ways the photon can go through the slit, two slits, but two adds up to zero in the sense that there can be destructive interference. And even though there are two paths for something to happen, the net result is that nothing happens. Okay, how does that work in our models? Well, the answer it seems is that what's happening is that in this bundle of GD6, the bundle of GD6 is turned so that one GD6 is basically going off to one corner of branch hill space and the other GD6 is going off to the other corner of branch hill space. And when it comes to measuring what happened, okay, I, I should explain this. The observer is themselves and is in some sense, the, the typical observer who says, I'm gonna measure whether we're in this quantum state. That means the observer is localized to a patch of branch hill space. The observer is saying, my detector is this thing that's measuring, was there anything in this patch of branch hill space? That's what it means to say, did we hit this quantum state? Um, did we, you know, in the Braquette formulation, did we, you know, is this Braquette thing non-zero? The, the um, uh, okay, so then the question is, uh, in that, let's say that these two photons go through these two different, you know, slits, the paths, the GD6 in, in, in multi-way space that correspond to those are routed to two different, completely different places. Then in some sense, they will, and this is, I'm being kind of vague here, but we have a somewhat more precise mathematical formulation of this. They will both sort of miss the observer in branch hill space. So the observer will say, oh, nothing happened. It didn't, you know, there was no result because the, the kind of the, 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 the support for these two outcomes were routed to different parts of branch hill space. Now we can get a little bit more precise and we can start thinking about when we think about the observer, we think about the observer as themselves a bundle of GD6 in multi-way space. And so then what we're asking is when we ask this question, what's the probability for something to happen? What we're essentially asking is how do the threads by which that thing can happen in the multi-way graph how do those overlap the threads which are, exist inside the observer? And we're not, you know, this is still in gestation. It's still being worked through. But roughly what happens is that the threads of the observer and the threads of the thing being observed, you're essentially uh, to sort of make a correspondence between these things, you're matching up every thread with every thread. And that's essentially where you end up getting this notion of the squaring of amplitudes to get probabilities is by virtue of the fact that what matters is kind of all the ways that these threads can be matched up. At least that's the, that's uh, maybe Jonathan has a crisper way to say this. We, we're, we're actually, this is somewhat related to Jonathan's uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of completions that I think gives a nice way to understand what's going on here. Um, and maybe Jonathan wants to, wants to make a, um, uh, a better crisper statement of this. I don't think there's that much more to add. I think I think you already said it pretty well. So so yeah. I mean, when you when you have states that would otherwise just you know in, in a conventional formulation of quantum mechanics would destructively interfere, uh, we've seen. Uh, you can go back. I think you can watch our quantum computing discussion for an explicit example of this. You see that they they end up as as being as being on opposite yeah. ends of branchial spaces, as as Stephen said, which correspond effectively to orthogonal vectors with respect to the multi-way evolution graph. So then. Um, as Stephen mentioned, one kind of operative way we have of modeling quantum measurement is in terms of these completion procedures, where we say the observer is, is defining equivalences between these microstates 
uh, 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 where those equivalences are defined by that observer's particular choice of reference frame, their particular choice of, of quantum observation frame. Um, and so then what happens is, when, so the, 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 those two uh, microstates that, that happen to, to destructively interfere, they are sort of maximally branch-like separated. When you translate that into the language of completions, what that means is you cannot consistently perform a completion on those two microstates without destroying all of the information. And so, as, as Stephen mentioned, sort of the geometrical inter interpretation for that is in order to be able to measure those two states, the observer would have to ha build some measurement op uh, some piece of measurement apparatus that was so extended in branchial space that it would basically measure everything and therefore would, would yield zero net information. In the completion case, we can actually show that explicitly, that the only symmetric completion procedure they can apply that would define an equivalence between those two states is one that yields exactly zero information. And so, so you can say in a very precise sense that the, the, the path weights for those two states cancel out. Yeah, that's good. I mean, okay, so the thing we're close to, you know, coming attraction is fermions versus bosons. Uh, fermions have the feature that when you have these, you know, these different paths adding up in effect, they're adding as opposed to, did I say fermions? Bosons, they add, fermions, they subtract. Um, we're sort of teetering on the brink of being able to say something about that, hopefully coming soon. That's one of the things we want to look at. Um, the, um, uh, okay, so question, okay, let, let me talk a little bit about what I've been doing in Ruleal space, and let me actually show you here something about that. Um, let me show you, this is my, uh, this is my homework, so to speak, of, um, of the thing I've been writing, which will turn into a bulletin soon. Um, the, uh, uh, okay, what is Ruleal space? Um, normally we think of uh, um, normally we think of um, our models as looking at, we have these rewrites applied to these, these rules for rewriting hypergraphs. But one thing you can ask is, what if you could rewrite hypergraphs with all possible rules that might apply? Not a particular rule, but all possible rules. That's a rather a weird concept. It's like saying the universe is following all possible rules. But it turns out because of causal invariance, there's a kind of relativity of rules and you can still make definite statements. And I kind of suspect this is how the universe actually works. Um, and uh, we can talk about what that means, but let, let's, look at, um, let's look at what it means in the case of Turing machines, okay? So what does, what is real space in the case of Turing machines? So Turing machines are these standard mathematical models invented in 1936 by Alan Turing for, for computation. This is a concrete Turing machine. It has a little head here and uh, it walks that head back and forth along a tape. The head has a state, it can be either up or down in this particular example. And uh, it has rules that say how to write colors onto the tape and how to flip the state of the head and how to move the head left or right, okay? So I have to say, I always thought Turing machines were a bit of a mess, but I've come to like Turing machines better because they actually are very clean mathematically uh, for looking at certain kinds of things here. I have a sort of a, another form called mobile automata that I came up with in the early 90s that, that um, uh, I think I'm gonna look at as well, but, but I actually, I'm liking Turing machines for, for this right now. And they have kind of the, the nice historical connections to theory of computation. Okay, so an ordinary Turing machine has a rule like this. It's a definite rule, the Turing machine does a definite thing. Rules of this type, which have two states, two colors, there are 4,096 of those rules. Here are the things that those do from a blank tape. Um, the, uh, okay. Now, if you know theory of computation, you've probably heard of non-deterministic Turing machines. Those are Turing machines which don't always follow the same rule. They might have two sets of possible rules that they could follow. And then to represent the, the behavior of a Turing machine, we have a multi-way graph. Uh, not usually called that in, in Turing machineology, but um, in fact, I don't even know what it is called. I don't think people really talk, give it a name, but it is, it is the graph of, which again, people almost never explicitly draw of what the non-deterministic um, uh, things, the, um, uh, what, what the sort of non-deterministic possibilities are for the Turing machine. So this is a Turing machine with these two sets of rules. And this is showing a multi-way graph that this is applying one of those rules, this is applying the other rule. And this is what the, what the Turing machine does. Okay, what is the Ruleal multi-way system? The Ruleal multiway system is something that I had never thought about before for Turing machines, which is 
It's the graph you get by following all possible. In other words, you make it the maximally, it's the extreme non-deterministic Turing machine. It says at every step, use any, every one of the 4,096 possible rules and apply all of those rules. So that thing will make a multi-way graph. This is that multi-way graph. So in the first step, what happens is from this state, you can go to different among those 4,096 rules. These are the possible things that happen. You go two steps, there is um, uh, the, um, oh, Alison Silver is, is really on the ball here, um, asking about the simplest non-deterministic Turing machine. Could there be a thing such as the universal non-deterministic Turing machine? Yes, I realized that about a week ago. Uh, there is, I'm looking for it. Um, lots of good things to say there. Um, Okay, in any case, the, um, uh, um, so let's, um, uh, okay, but back to this. So this is a, um, a ruleal graph, um, a ruleal multi-way graph. I call it a ruleal graph because it is showing the outcome from all possible rules. Um, it's at each step, okay? Now, Many of those possible rules actually do the same thing. That's why there are only two edges coming out here. If I were to show all the possible rules separately, there would be a big bundle of edges going to the same place. Okay, so the question then is, um, the, uh, okay, so, so what's happening here at every step, uh, here's a piece of my thing that isn't finished yet, but at every step, is this correct or is this still incorrect? Um, not sure if this is correct yet. Um, but at every step, every you can apply any one of these should be 32 possible rules. So every at every every step in the evolution of the Turing machine, you just say, I'm going to do, I'm going to be extreme non-deterministic. I'm going to apply every one of these possible rules. Okay. All right. So this is this is what happens. This is the multi-way graph that represents Turing machine evolution, that represents the extreme evolution of the extreme non-deterministic Turing machine in, uh, in multi-way space. So every one of these dots here is a configuration of a Turing machine. And this is staying, starting from, a, let's say a blank tape in the middle here. This shows sort of the treeing out of all possible uh, non-deterministic Turing machine outcomes. Okay, so one little spoiler here. This space, okay, so this, this creature, um, this is, this is non-deterministic Turing machine space. And unfortunately, it's very big, so it takes a long time for my notebook to load here. Um, uh, come on, come on, come on. Okay, so one of the things I was just figuring out is this structure turns out to be the Cayley graph of a group. And so I've been on a hunt for the last 10 days for what group is it? And actually, um, uh, Tally, who's been on some of our live streams, I was talking to yesterday, and um, uh, Tally, uh, uh, after we, we defined some things, actually uh, also my, okay, my, my son Christopher had done some pieces to this and Tally did some pieces to this. And um, anyway, the end result is uh, we now have a construction for what this, let's see if I can show you. I, I haven't yet put it in here, so it's not, um, not quite finished, but um, uh, the, this we might call it the Turing machine group. Um, this is the Turing machine group for the case of Turing machines with, um, uh, let's see, tapes, cyclic tapes of length three. And it's, this is the Cayley graph of a group. And that Cayley graph is the multi-way graph, is the ruleal multi-way graph of the Turing machine. And so we finally now know what the group is, and I would have to pull it up to, um, but we have group relations someplace here, which I haven't written down properly, but we know the group relations and we know what this group is. And it's a semi-direct product of, certain other groups, and it has been somewhat studied, I think, although I need to read more about it, um, as a kind of generalization of symmetric groups. So that's kind of interesting. So it tells us this: there's this Turing machine uh, group that represents non-deterministic Turing machine space, okay? So this is the Ruleal multiway graph. It's the space of all possible, uh, not all, so the, a non-deterministic Turing machine follows a path in this graph. And so a non-deterministic Turing machine, if you say, how do I get from this state to this state? There's a geodesic that you can follow 
that can be followed by the extreme non-deterministic Turing machine that gets from this state to this state. Okay, so that's the life of non-deterministic Turing machines. Okay, next question. How does this relate to uh, deterministic Turing machines? Okay, so let's imagine a deterministic Turing machine. This is a particular deterministic Turing machine. The evolution of that particular deterministic Turing machine corresponds to a path from a particular initial state, corresponds to a path in this essentially Turing machine group space. Okay, so at every, at every step in the evolution of the deterministic Turing machine, it's visiting a new configuration in this, in this Turing machine space in effect. Okay, that's, that path is not a JD6. The, um, the, the, there is not necessarily the shortest path. The deterministic Turing machine may waste a huge amount of time getting to one of these outcomes here. Um, so, okay, so one question we can ask is, um, what is, okay, so this was for a different initial condition, that Turing machine follows a different path. Okay, so now we can ask um, the, um, okay, that's one that definitely isn't a JD stick, it has a big kink in it. So now we can ask the question, if we look at all possible deterministic Turing machines, so we say, let's get, I really want to get to, some state that's out here in the periphery. Give me the best non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, sorry, the best deterministic Turing machine that gets me to that state. The Turing, the deterministic Turing machine that in the fastest, the shortest number of steps gets me to that state. Can I get there? Can I not get there? Okay, so this picture shows the deterministic Turing machines, all 4,096 deterministic Turing machines of this type. It shows in red where they can get in a certain number of steps. And so you see there are states here that no deterministic, well, a non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, by using different rules at different steps, can get to that state. The deterministic Turing machine cannot reach that state in that number of steps. Okay? So, okay, so some people probably know computational complexity theory here and are probably already guessing where this is going. Um, so, but what this is saying is the non-deterministic Turing machines can reach a certain place in this Turing machine graph, the deterministic ones can't quite reach there. Okay, what does this remind us of? This reminds us of the P versus NP problem. So the P versus NP problem is the question, if you have a, a deterministic algorithm uh, that as a function of, its, of the size of the instance of the problem runs in a time that's polynomial, a number of steps, requires a number of steps, it's a polynomial in the size of the problem, that's called a P, polynomial time algorithm. NP, is the, is the set of non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms, the set of algorithms which are, among other things, polynomial time for a non-deterministic Turing machine. So P is the set of algorithms which are polynomial time for a deterministic Turing machine, NP the set of algorithms which are polynomial time for a non-deterministic Turing machine. And, and that can be interpreted as saying, if you guess the answer, you can check it in polynomial time. But but the, the, you, know, you can also define it as it's polynomial time for a non-deterministic Turing machine. Okay, so what you're seeing here is basically the comparison between deterministic Turing machine space and non-deterministic Turing machine space. And so the P versus NP problem is the question of is NP, the space of non-deterministic polynomial time algorithms, bigger than P, the space of polynomial time algorithms? Okay, so this is kind of a, the beginning of a geometrization of that question, because this is basically saying, so I have to be a little bit more precise to talk about what P and NP are in these, in these systems. Um, so the, um, uh, so what, what's happening here is, uh, so as we, as we scan over the different possible initial conditions for a Turing machine, we're scanning over. So, so this, I, I told you this was the, the Cayley graph of a group. So, uh, if you're math oriented, you know that means it's a vertex transitive graph. It means the graph looks, the infinite graph looks the same from every vertex, it's homogeneous. Which is to say, it doesn't matter what the initial state of the Turing machine was, the initial configuration of its tape, you'll always have the same set of possible places you can go from that. Okay, so now what we're seeing is this, so when we think about a polynomial time algorithm, what we're saying is, We've picked an algorithm. We've picked a particular deterministic Turing machine that represents our algorithm. We could also pick a prefix for a universal machine, but let's not go there, it doesn't matter. Okay, 
So given that, as we scan over the different inputs for our initial condition, we are scanning over a, a certain set of possible uh, positions in this Turing machine graph, okay? Now, as we look at, as we increase the size of our initial conditions, as we increase the problem instance size, we're looking at a bigger and bigger ball of initial positions in this graph. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking this long snake and we're starting the tail of the snake, so to speak, no, I better say the head of the snake, at a particular place in this graph. And then we're seeing where does the tail of the snake go, okay? So what will happen is, as we move that head of the snake around, the tail of the snake will flail around all over the place, okay? The tail of the snake will base, but every, every time, wherever we start it, the tail of the snake will be, will wind up in some position here, okay? Now, we could have, one of the questions is, if what we're trying to, so, so the question is, how does, how ergodic is the tail of the snake? So by which I mean, to what extent, as we change the initial conditions here, to what extent does the tail of the snake scan over all possible configurations, okay? And essentially that is the question of P versus NP. It's the question of whether uh, we know that the complete Turing machine graph is the set of, of configurations that can be reached by an NP, a non-deterministic uh, Turing machine, in some sense, in some time that is that corresponds to a certain number of, of uh, sort of segments in the snake, a certain number of steps. A certain, there's a certain geodesic ball of where we can reach in this Ruleal multiway graph, and that is defining the, the frontier of NP problems. Then the question is, how far can a deterministic P problem reach? Okay. So I think what we're getting from this is essentially a geometrization of the P versus NP problem. And so what we need to understand is, for example, what is the limit? Uh, we understand, okay, so this is, we understand as of last night, and I haven't really fully digested it yet, what this group structure is for the multi-way, really multi-way graph. And so we don't fully understand, at least I don't fully understand yet, the geometric group theory interpretation of the limit of that group for the infinite case. I think that is probably going to be understandable with geometric group theory. Um, so that tells us something about the space of NP problems or the space of NP things. So, so now the question is, what can we say about the space of, of P, of, of deterministic things? And let me show you an example. So I, this was, um, uh, yeah, the, the question is always, you know, is P versus equal to NP? The question is always, you know, can we find an algorithm that is, uh, you know, is there a Turing machine, an algorithm that succeeds in doing this NP complete, this problem that is the hardest for it, that it can be for NP, this NP complete problem in polynomial time? If we could, we'd prove that P is equal to NP. But what happens is when you try and really do that, when you try and find what is the optimal algorithm for progressively larger instances of a problem, that is a very squiggly issue. So for example, here's the case of sorting networks. These are the optimal sorting networks, the optimal ways of doing comparisons between, um, uh, between, um, uh, uh, between values to sort different numbers of things. And what you see is that the optimal algorithm is a very complicated, messy thing. And if you ask what's the infinite limit of this, it's gonna be hard to know what that limit looks like. Okay, so having said that, what is the space of deterministic Turing machine computations? Okay, so what we're doing now is I've said there's a graph here that is the deterministic Turing machine computations that is embedded in the full Turing machine graph, the full Turing machine group Cayley graph. Okay, but now we could just pluck out that deterministic graph and we can look at that on its own. We can just say, given the possible Turing machines, what, um, uh, which states do they reach and when do they reach common states? So let's take a look at that. So this creature, this sort of sea urchin-like creature represents starting from a configuration of a Turing machine at the center that is a, 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 a head in the middle blank tape. This is looking at other possible configurations of the Turing machine. And eventually uh, with all possible deterministic Turing machine rules, but each one is a deterministic Turing machine. So the spokes here, basically correspond, when you get far out in the spoke, there's just one surviving deterministic Turing machine that gets you to that config particular configuration. In the central region, there are many different deterministic Turing machines that get you to the same 
uh, to the same state. So if we look at that central region, it has quite a bit of connectivity there. But when we get out into the periphery, there's only one solitary Turing machine, the deterministic Turing machine that's getting you to that particular place. So we can ask questions like, uh, what's the, what, how many Turing machines, uh, how many distinct states do we reach when we go a certain distance out? Um, and uh, you know, what, do, what are those strands in this deterministic Turing machine graph look like? And that's, the strands have a lot of fine structure. So that's a strand and what that's representing is there are several Turing machines. Here are examples on that strand of what Turing machines live on that strand. What Turing machines are, are doing things which all lead to states. They all lead to the same state. So they're all living, you know, they all go to a state on the strand, but the Turing machine, the, the, the edges here, which correspond to different Turing machine rules are different, but they're all sort of bundled together on the strand. Okay, so, so this is kind of the picture of deterministic Turing machine space and its comparison to non-deterministic space. And so this, I mean, I, I, I don't have a conclusion from this other than to say that I think uh, if we could understand the continuum limit of this, as I think we now can, as of last night, maybe have a decent chance of understanding the continuum limit of non-deterministic Turing machine space, then I think we could have a geometrical understanding um, to, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for the P versus MP problem, which will be quite exciting. Um, I might mention you can do the same thing as I've done with Turing machines here. You can do it with cellular automata. Uh, I'm just amazed that having studied cellular automata for 40 years, I've never done this before. But anyway, this is, this is the, the different sort of elementary cellular automata living in this multi-way graph showing how they end up with common states or not. So it's kind of this is sort of pruning it down. There's my favorite rule 30 off on that prong. It just diverged from probably rule 94, if I know my cellular automaton rules. Um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, yeah, so I'm just looking, I'm just glancing at the comments here. Marcos is commenting, the machines are close topologically. Yeah, that's basically what we're saying here. There's a, there's a notion of a ruleal space in which in this multi-way graph, we can start looking, I, I, should have, I should have shown this, we can start, this defines the con connection of, 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 of machines by virtue of not being far apart in the ruleal graph, having nearby common ancestors in the ruleal multi-way graph, that gives a nearness for machines. And so we can, we can represent that nearness of machines. I think I had some pictures um, of, uh, in terms of ruleal graphs of machine states and machines and so on, and this, this is a way of representing um, how close things are. It's a way of defining closeness for configurations of machines. Okay, so how does this apply to the universe? Well, I mean, I think it applies, it's really pretty interesting for computational complexity theory, but um, uh, we're also trying to do physics here. So, so how does it apply to physics? All right, let's see, this was so, so one question is how does universal Turing machine apply here? And that just has to do with a Turing machine. That's a little complicated, but basically it has to do with an ergodicity of a Turing machine in this, um, uh, um, in this space. Um, question from Marcos about partial order on models. Interesting. Not sure is the answer to that. I'm not sure offhand. Okay, this is the craziest part. It's not crazy, it's, it's, it's just very abstract. Okay, so uh, let's talk about, um, okay, let's talk about sort of uh, the world of ruleal space. Okay, what is ruleal space? What does it mean? Okay, so we've talked about a ruleal space is this ruleal multiway graph represents the evolution of essentially the universe according to all possible rules. At every step, every possible rule of the universe is used. Every possible rule of evolution is used. Okay, now this is where things get a little bit mind bending. We're also now thinking about the observer being part of this universe. The observer is themselves a thing that exists in this ruleal multiway graph where all these different rules are getting applied. It's about like the same as in quantum mechanics. And I suspect that Jonathan's interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of completions can also apply in ruleal space and that we can start thinking about ruleal completions, but we don't have to go there quite yet. 
uh, what we, oh, so one thing I should say about real multi-way graphs is causal invariance is very easy to get in them. And that sort of almost inevitably arises. Uh, okay, in the first approximation. Okay, so now, how do we describe the universe? We've got this Ruleal multi-way graph that shows all these different possible uh, paths corresponding to different possible specific rules for the universe. Just like I was showing you deterministic Turing machines living in this space, in this background space of non-deterministic Turing machines. So similarly here, there is a deterministic rule for the universe that lives in this background space of all possible rules for the universe. So, okay, so we've got, um, the, uh, we've got this, this path that corresponds to a particular rule that we're attributing to being how our universe works. Okay, so what does it mean to move around in real space? Okay, what it, no, let me, let me put that a different way. What does it mean to pick a different reference frame with which we're referring to parts. Uh, these are both conflated in a certain way. The, the, um, and again, this is very abstract and it's just sort of at the, at the edge of my understanding. So uh, let me say it roughly and it may not be quite, quite correct, but roughly moving around in real space is moving around in the description language that you're using to describe the universe. So, it's not quite right. It's really more like the reference frames that you're using. But those reference frames might be a, a Ruleal observation frame, might be one that is localizing you to a particular place in Ruleal space. But the, the, the thing that we can understand is we're picking a particular description of the universe and that's the one that we're using for our universe. Okay, so now we can ask questions like, um, well, all kinds of questions. So one question would be, in Ruleal space, we have this Ruleal multi-way graph. It's, it's, there are all these different possibilities for where we'd land up in Ruleal space. Remember the Turing machines. There are all these different configurations of the Turing machine, and our Ruleal multi-way graph knits together those different configurations by telling us which configuration is near which other one by ancestry in the Ruleal multi-way graph, or alternatively said, by Ruleal distance between those configurations. Okay, so we're, we're basically getting something where we are looking at, as time progresses, as computation takes place, how rapidly do two points diverge in real space? In effect, we can think just in, in physical space, we have an event that happens. The effect of that event is seen at most at different points in space at the speed of light. We have a light cone, this region of what part of space can be affected by an event that happened. That light cone, the size of that light cone, after a certain time, the size of that light cone is determined by speed of light times the amount of time that's elapsed. The maximum distance that we can affect in time t is c times t, okay? So in, in branchial space of quantum mechanics, we think there's a similar thing going on that after a certain time, the maximum quantum entanglement that could occur, the maximum distance you can go in branchial space is this thing we're calling zeta times t. Okay, so in, in Ruleal space, there's a, a similar kind of thing where there's a, a thing we're calling it rho, which is the maximum rate of divergence of a, of a, of a cone in Ruleal space, of the effect of an event in Ruleal space. There is a a divergence of, um, uh, of the effect of that event in real space. Okay, what on earth is that, that rho quantity? That rho quantity is, uh, in a sense, we can call that cone an emulation cone. That cone determines, in some sense, the maximum rate at which one model of the universe can be converted, one rule by which we model the universe can be converted into another rule by which we model the universe. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is pretty abstract and I'm, I'm um, but, but so what's happening in real space is this, this cone in real space determines if we're an observer in the universe and we say, uh, you know, we are going to 
not keep a fixed view of how the universe works. We're going to be changing our view and we're going to be doing it at a certain speed. The maximum speed at which we can change our view of the universe is this rho quantity. And in some sense, what that means is, why does that happen? Well, we are using our description of the universe is happening in the universe itself. And so it's for that reason that there is, when we sort of weave back the effect of the observer to observe the universe that they're in themselves, we see that there has to be a maximum rate of this divergence of descriptions, a maximum rate at which we can change our view of how the universe works. Okay, so what is this? Um, so one thing that we might ask is, what is the interpretation of, so we can, we can think about all kinds of crazy things with this, with this rho quantity. We can think about all kinds of crazy things happening in Rulial space. So, so one thing I don't really understand very well is what the geodesics of Rulial space are. In the case of Turing machines, they are the fastest path non-deterministically to get to a particular result. Um, but I don't really understand what the significance of that is in Rulial space yet. Um, I don't understand, um, uh, yeah, so I don't, don't really understand that. So there's a question earlier about what the analog of the Einstein equations is in Rulial space. And I think we can say a little bit about that. So here, here's a question. What is the analog of, um, uh, uh, what's the analog of black holes in Rulial space? Okay, so this we can say something about. So normally in Rulial space, we can imagine that there are multiple, uh, multiple frames, multiple descriptions we can be using. Um, we are, um, we're able to say that we take a path through Rulial space and that path is equivalent to another path. We, we, can, uh, we can, by changing our frame, we can make one path do the same as what another path does. So in other words, we can change our description language. We can end up saying there's a different rule for the universe. Okay, well, that's all well and good, but here's the thing that won't work. So let's say that the path we consider, the rule we consider is a computationally reducible rule. It's not a rule that has universal computation. It's not a rule that shows computational irreducibility. It's a rule that's just really dumb. All it does is to say the answer is three every time. It just says the answer is three, the answer is three, the answer is three. Well, we can't take that the answer is three uh, path in Rulio. We can't take that place in Rulio space and say, oh, we can somehow convert that to a, a true description of the universe. There just isn't enough stuff going on in that particular uh, sort of path in the universe, that, uh, roughly that particular position in Rulio space to be able to give a full featured description of the universe. So that's kind of like a black hole. So that's saying that the pockets of computational reducibility in this sort of ocean of computationally irreducible computational processes, the places in that space of possible rules that are so dumb in effect that they just, uh, they, they can't, they sort of, they can't perform an infinite computation. They get stuck after a fixed time. They, they are reducible. You can just say the answer is whatever. Those are the things that, that um, are like black holes or more to the point, probably like space-like singularities, which live at the center of certain black holes. They are places where, probably like all black holes actually, they're places where the sort of the geodesics that represent the continued computational evolution of the universe just stop. So in a sense, there is a, uh, there's a certain in Rulial space, there would be these sort of computationally reducible theories dotted around Rulial space that correspond to the black holes of Rulial space. And this rho quantity will be the escape velocity in Rulial space above which you form a black hole in Rulial space. Now, again, I don't really understand how this all fits together yet, um, but I think there's a notion of something. I, I don't yet understand this. And, and, and I think that this idea, there may very well be at least metaphors of sort of the development of knowledge, the development of ideas, the development of different rule systems as ways of describing things for this rule of space, which we're inventing as something to describe the space of all possible physics is, and which we are now applying to understand computational complexity theory and Turing machines, but it may also have applications in, in essentially the theory of knowledge and so on at, at a more general level, having nothing to do with the universe in particular. But if we talk about the universe in particular, we can ask questions like, what is the value of rho 
in our universe in particular, right? Just like we can say, what is the value of zeta, the, the, uh, the maximum entanglement speed in our universe in particular? What is the value of the speed of light in our universe in particular? Well, the speed of light is measured in distance per unit time, okay? So in order to say the numerical value of the speed of light, 2.99, whatever it is, 79 times 10 to the eight meters per second, we have to know we're measuring in meters per second. If it was measured in, you know, uh, uh, you know, fathoms per fortnight or something, it would be a, it would have a different numerical value. So we have to decide what is our unit for, for example, length, what is our unit for time? The natural unit for time in our models is the elementary time, which is about maybe 10 to the minus 100, uh, roughly 10 to the minus 100 seconds. So roughly, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a guess based on various things. But um, so, so when we measure length in physical space, we have the notion of we have what we, what the speed of light is doing is it's converting this one essentially unitless thing, the elementary time, into which is essentially the 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 thing we're attributing to a single computational update is the elementary time. It takes an elementary time. Time is computation, and the a single elementary time is a single computational operation, and it takes and it takes that. It takes a single computational operation takes one elementary time to occur. But that computational operation spread out in physical space is speed of light uh, div times, elementary, div uh, times elementary time gives the extent in space that can, be, uh, that can be reached by a single operation. Okay, in branchial space, this quantity zeta is a... Um, uh, can be measured is, is roughly related to Planck's constant. Planck's constant has units of energy times time. Um, it isn't exactly Planck's constant, but the, 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 uh, the, the quantity that for us is this maximum entanglement speed ends up being measured in terms of essentially an energy per unit time. And, and we can convert it to mass and a guess for its possible value is about 10 to the five solar masses per second might be the maximum entanglement speed, but its units are energy per unit time. Okay, what are the units of rho? So the units of rho are essentially, we have a, um, uh, let's see, they are basically information content per unit time, are the units of rho. They are our description length for, uh, a rule, they are measuring that description length and they are the, the units. So in ruleal space, we've got time going down, but we've got in, in the extent of ruleal space, we move from one rule to another. We are essentially measuring the information content that, that the measure of distance, I think, is information content of rules. Okay, so what on earth is the information content of a rule? How do we measure that? Well, you know, we have Shannon information theory, which measures information in bits. That's all well and good, but Shannon information doesn't say what the bits mean. So in other words, when we're talking about Shannon information, just in terms of probabilities on a communication channel, those kinds of things, we are just counting, okay, these are the possible things on the communication channel. They don't have anything to do with the semantics of what the communication channel means. But for us, we need our rules to actually say, this is what you do to the hypergraph to evolve the universe. Okay, so we actually need semantics in our rules. So we need to be able to have, what we actually want is a unit of information content that is a semantic unit of information content. We need something that can tell us, uh, you know, if we describe our universe in terms of Turing machine rules, if we describe our universe in terms of Wolfram language, uh, you know, programs, we can, in each of those cases, we can say, what is the information content? How many bits, how many Wolfram language tokens does it take to describe the rule for the universe? Or a rule, uh, you know, to, how, how, how many differences of tokens do we need to have to go from this one rule to another? So I think the, the dimensions of rho, information content per unit time, must be measured in some unit of information content. And that unit of information content has to be a semantic unit of information content in terms of some language for describing computation. 
And so, you know, I have to say my favorite one is the language we've been building for the last 40 years, Walton language, but we could be Turing machines. Turing machines will be much, there'll be a big constant of proportionality because it's a lot of effort to, you know, emulate the whole Walton language with a Turing machine. But, you know, it's just a constant difference, just like the difference between light years and millimeters. It's just a constant difference. Um, it isn't exactly a constant difference. There's some footnotes about how you do conversions between these things and you know interpreters and the de deviations of lengths of interpreters and so on. Let's not go there. Let's just say you're measuring ruleal distance in terms of semantic information content, which I claim can best be measured in terms of Wolfram language tokens. So the units of rho are Wolfram language tokens per second. And in a sense, what rho is doing then is it's measuring the intrinsic processing speed of the universe. It's measuring how many Wolfram language tokens per second can the universe ingest? Can the universe actually run? Okay, so what's the value of that? Well, I'm not sure, but I think that it is related to the size of, so there are many parallel threads in the multi-way, rule your multi-way graph that correspond to all these different possible rules that are being applied. There's also, Within each rule, you can say, well, what conceivable rules could apply to the universe? Well, mostly the biggest rule we could apply, the biggest left-hand side for the, the rewrite rule is the size of the universe itself. So that gives us sort of a bound on the size of rules we're dealing with. And I think in a rough approximation that it may be fair to say that the value of rho is approximately the number of uh, nodes in the spatial hypergraph measured uh, given that in our update rules, it's on the order of one. It's not exactly one Wolfram language token per, per, per node in a hypergraph, but let's say it's about one, maybe it's five, I don't know, maybe it's, but it's of order one. And on the, on the, the orders of magnitude we're dealing with, it's very, very close to order one. So that would mean that with our other estimate for the size of, of the spatial hypergraph and so on, and the size of the elementary time, rho would be about 10 to the 450 Wolfram language tokens per second. So that would be a measure of the intrinsic processing speed of the universe. Okay, so you could ask the question, how many Wolfram language tokens have been, gener have been processed in the history of the universe? The answer to that in a first approximation, I think would be about uh, 10 to the 10 to the 350. Uh, so that's a, a big number. Um, so there's questions here about, um, whether, uh, whether we can observe um, the, um, uh, whether we can observe the value of rho. Can we observe uncertainty? Can we observe, so I mentioned earlier that I think the analog of the uncertainty principle is the failure of, the temporary failure of inductive inference for deducing how the universe works based on observations of it. But probably at the scale we're talking about, it's a, it's a too small a phenomenon, probably. Um, can we, observe real black holes? Can we observe these pockets of reducibility? What's the density of real black holes? Okay, so this is one, actually, Jonathan made this, made this connection. Um, the, uh, uh, it's a cute connection. The density of real black holes is related to a thing called omega, invented by my good friend, Greg Chaitin, uh, as the omega is the halting probability for a universal Turing machine. So, Imagine you start a universal Turing machine with all possible inputs, with some of those inputs in the classical model of Turing machines. Actually, we don't tend to use Turing machines that do this, but, but you know, do not have to say whether it halts or just reaches a certain state. So some of these Turing machines will, after 100 steps, they'll reach that special state, the halting state. Another one, it might reach it after 1,000 steps. Another one, it might go into a loop and never reach it at all. Another one, we might be watching for a trillion steps and we still don't know if it reaches it. But omega is the probability that a universal Turing machine halts after, from all possible inputs. Okay, so what's the value of omega? Oh, is it 0.3, is it whatever? What's its value? Well, here's the difficult thing. Its value is non-computable. Why, why is that? Well, imagine we've got all these Turing machines and some of them we can say, oh, we saw it halted. Great, it's in the halted bin. Oh, this other Turing machine, oh, we saw it went into a loop, it's in the non-halting bin. But then there are these, these scraggly, you know, these Turing machines that are just very obstinate. 
and they just can't, I shouldn't, perhaps, they, they, they just can't decide what they want to do. They keep going, they're going a trillion steps, they're going a quintillion steps, they're going 10 to the 10 to the 10 steps, and they're still squaggling around, and we don't know what they're going to do. Because of computational irreducibility, there may be no faster way to find out what that Turing machine is going to do than to just trace all those steps. But since there's no bound on how many steps the Turing machine may go, we have to say that's an undecidable question, whether it will halt. That's the classic undecidability of the halting problem for Turing machines. But that means this quantity omega is fundamentally non-computable because some of the Turing machines that we would have to know whether they halt, fundamentally, there's no upper bound to, to the, there's no way to know whether they'll halt. So that means the density of black holes in Rulial space, uh, which would be, which is essentially the density of black holes is the density of computationally reducible things, which is roughly halting uh, Turing machines. It's roughly the density of halting Turing machines. And um, you have to sort of pull it back to talking about universal Turing machines, but it'll, it'll boil down to the same thing. Um, then that quantity, so this is the weird thing. So the density of black holes in Rulial space is undecidable, is uncomputable. So what does that mean? Well, why does that, how could that possibly be right? Well, the answer is what's happening is that in Rulial space, let's say we're watching Rulial space and we're saying, did a black hole form? And by the way, we could do this for our Turing machines and things like that. It, it won't, for the, for the ordinary non-deterministic Turing machines, nothing terribly exciting will happen because the background space is rather simple. But for, for other systems, we might have a more sophisticated thing going on. But, um, and we might be forming Actually, is that even true? I think we might even be able to see black holes in, in, in Turing machine real space. Um, in any case, so we, yeah, in fact, we should be able to, now that I think about it, we should be able to. Um, the, uh, and, and so the problem is you're looking at a piece of real space and you say, did this make a black hole? Oh, there's some things where there's some GD6 which seem to be trapped. Are they really going to be trapped forever or are they going to find a way to escape? That's an undecidable question in general. And that's why this density of black holes can be undecidable. So I think um, the, uh, um, okay, so, so let's, let's talk about one more thing about Rulial space, which is imagine, so we've got an interpretation of a black hole in Rulial space. What about a white hole in Rulial space? What about something that is a, um, and maybe this isn't quite right, but, but um, okay, so the question is, plop a hypercomputer into Rulial space. And let's say our Turing machine, Rulial space. Just imagine that we also have, in addition to our happy Turing machines, we have a hyper-Turing machine. What is a hyper-Turing machine? Hyper-Turing machine is a Turing machine which says, oh, you don't have to waste all your time waiting for an infinite time to answer that halting problem. I, the hyper-Turing machine, just know the answer. I can immediately tell you with my hyper operations, I can immediately tell you the answer to that halting problem is it doesn't halt or something. It's uh, Alan Turing called these oracles. Uh, you, you just ask this oracle machine, does my machine halt or not? And it just tells you the answer. Okay, so that's hyper computation is, and so the question is in rule space, imagine that you had rules that corresponded to hyper computation. What would those look like to an observer in Rulial space, to the hypercomputer, our universe, our just pure Turing level universe would look like a black hole in hypercomputational space. But to us, that hypercomputational space will presumably look like a white hole. That is, it will be something where it is spewing out, um, essentially, I think, is sort of spewing out Rulial JD6, I think. I'm not quite sure if this is right. Um, but anyway, so the question would be, um, what, uh, you know, can you make? So in hypercomputational space, you can again make a Rulial multiway graph where, where, the, where the edges of the Rulial multiway graph aren't ordinary Turing machine operations, they're hyper Turing machine computations. Okay, so, and, and again, in that hyper, uh, hyper Rulial multiway graph, we will appear as a black hole. And so now imagine, so what about the whole hierarchy of those things? Is there a whole hierarchy of hypercomputational Rulial multiway systems? Well, the answer is yes, presumably. And that hierarchy is defined by the arithmetic hierarchy related to the Grigorchik hierarchy. Um, the, uh, 
it's a hierarchy of sort of levels of description of first you have a Turing machine, then you have a Turing machine with an oracle. Then you say, okay, but what about the whole thing of the Turing machine with the oracle? Well, then you need a double oracle to do that. And pretty soon you build up this whole hierarchy of oracular Turing machines, and you can keep going forever. You can start going into up, up until transfinite numbers, transfinite layers of oracleness, so to speak. So you've essentially extended hypercomputation into transfinite hypercomputation. So hyper transfinite numbers are what Cantor invented in 1870s, I guess, where you're just counting all the numbers. So an ordinal transfinite number is you count all the numbers and you say, what's the number that's one greater than every number I counted to? And let's just call it lowercase omega. And so then we can say, what's, then we can say, well, okay, we've got lowercase omega. We can say omega plus one is yet another number distinct from omega. One plus omega, uh, arithmetic isn't commutative in transfinite numbers. Um, one plus omega is still just omega because we start off with one and we go count, 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 count. Uh, and we still only end up with the, the last number we reach omega. Anyway, you can, you can keep going in transfinite numbers and you can build these whole hierarchies of transfinite numbers. And uh, it gets very complicated because there is the notion of a, of a transfinite number. You might say, well, with my omega, I can say omega to the omega to the omega to the omega. And let's take the limit of that as we go far enough. I think that's called epsilon zero. And we can then take epsilon zero. We can take the limit of the limit of the limit of the limit of that. And that has to, and then we, we end up getting this whole hierarchy of names. There is no absolute infinity. There's just a hierarchy of these named infinities, which goes on forever. So we can imagine a hierarchy of Ruleal multiway graphs that goes on forever like that. Um, we uh, won't ever know anything about it. We, as observers in our universe, won't be, won't be able to detect what's going on, but we can just imagine that there's a sort of hyper universe that contains this whole hierarchy of things. And, and we can think about mathematically what those kinds of things mean. But um, I mean, it's difficult enough dealing with the Ruleal multiway graph to, to, to deal with that. Um, let's see, I, I, there are a few questions here. Uh, oh, I, I should say something about quantum computers. Um, oh yeah, there's a question from William here saying, is the universe the output of computing Chaitin's constant? That's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, not, you know, that gives a, a, a very strange twist to a long time debate between Greg Chaitin and myself. The long time debate is, is the universe like pi or like omega? So if it's like pi, there's a Turing machine that can just compute the states of the universe. If it's like omega, the state of the universe is not computable by a Turing machine. So I think what we're saying here is that the ultimate state of Ruleal space, boy, that's interesting. That's a kind of we were both right type situation. The ultimate state of Ruleal space is presumably governed by omega because the ultimate state of Ruleal space will have a bunch of presumably, I mean, just like our universe has a bunch of black holes in it, uh, well, this is getting, uh, it's, it's complicated here, but I, there's some sense in which the ultimate state is described by uh, that constant. And that's very interesting. Okay, I hadn't thought of that. Very, very interesting idea. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, a question here. So I'm, I'm going to take these questions probably rather out of order. Actually, look, I do want to say one thing about quantum computers. Okay, so we have this emerging model of quantum computers. And one of the things we're doing, hopefully Jonathan's been working on this, I haven't been asking, um, to, uh, uh, let's see, Jonathan said sort of in response to something I said. So I think that means Jonathan has to, has to explain what he means by that. Okay, what? Oh, no, what no, 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 sorry, that, that, was, that, was just, that was the Chaitin's constant um, question. I mean, I wasn't going to say anything different to what you said. That, that, you okay, know, that fine. the late time behavior of our universe is dominated by the ratios of g, c, and uh, and lambda that that dictates the you know the the, the rate the, the propensity of our universe to form black holes. And so, presumably, the analog of general relativity in Ruleal space, the same kind of cosmology applies. That there's a there's a interrelationship between rho, omega, and whatever the whatever the non determinism constant for for Ruleal space is. Um, that, that will, yeah, so, so, so I think it's- Well, you're, uh, you're saying the analog of the cosmological constant for real space. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a complicated thing to think about. I mean, uh, you know, another big issue is 
the knitting together of space in Rulial space, what on earth does that correspond to? Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I sent Greg an email actually last night because I was, I literally, I'd written the sentence that said, you know, uh, Greg's omega is the density of black holes in Rulial space. Now I have to append to that um, the, uh, the statement that actually his long time claim that the universe might be like omega and not like pi might in some sense be correct as well, which is, uh, which is really interesting. Okay, quantum computers for a second. Okay, so what I hope Jonathan has been working on is building a compiler that goes from our quantum computing framework, our very, I could say our classic, classical quantum computing framework, our traditional quantum computing framework in terms of, you know, gates and, and, um, and states and quantum operators and all those kinds of things. We have a very nice framework we've been building up for the last few years for Wolfram language for doing quantum, for specifying quantum computations that could be fed to a, in principle, to a quantum computer. Um, so that is a, a good way of representing all the things that show up in quantum computation and quantum information theory. So the question then is, what um, can we compile that into our multi-way graphs and our interpretation of quantum mechanics in terms of branchial space and so on? And it looks great. We're going to be able to do this. We, we've got to fill some details in. But one of the things that we can then do is we not only can compile the operation of the quantum uh, computation and the gates of the quantum computer, we can also compile the measurement operations. And that's very important because in traditional treatments of quantum computing, measurement is just this sort of separate black box that is not part of the story of the micro description of the quantum computer. But in our model, it is the story of the micro description of the quantum computer. And so the picture of a quantum computer ends up being first the quantum computer, just like in that non-deterministic Turing machine story, it trees out all these possibilities. It reaches far out in branchial space. It's, it's populating lots of branchial space, doing all those non-deterministic threads of figuring out what the possible factors of a number might be and so on. It's, it's, it's treeing all that stuff out by, by occupying a large region, not a physical space, but a large region of branchial space. It's kind of like a, a time memory trade-off you could, you could do, or it's like, it's like saying, you know, it's like talking about parallel threads, memory trade-offs, things like this. And, but what we're talking about here is, a, um, uh, is something where in branchial space, we're parallelizing in branchial space, and we're seeing that there are these different pieces of the comp comp quantum computation that are happening in different parts of branchial space. Okay, but when we want to measure things, we are just this observer sitting at some place in branchial space, in effect. And what we have to do is corral those, those things that happened all over branchial space. We have to collect. It's like a map produce. We've, we've done the map. We've, you know, that's out there in branchial space. Now we have to do the reduce. We have to actually get everything back to get an answer. Okay, so in traditional views of quantum computing, you don't really talk about that. You just say, well, we did a measurement. Okay, in our model, you are talking about every little step you have to take in branchial space to navigate that information from the outer reaches of branchial space back to where you're observing it. Okay, so the question is how much effort does it take to do that? And this is where it gets interesting. It probably takes a lot of effort to do that. In fact, it probably takes about as much effort to do that as it took to, as the branching out took. So in other words, you're, you're putting as much effort to corral it back into that thing at the end, you're putting all this computational effort, you're arranging something. So this study of, 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 of Rulial space and, and, and so on, I mean, we're, we're now we're talking about branchial space, but, but I think there's going to be some way of understanding what we're doing with non-deterministic Turing machines and things to see something about whether um, even in branchial space, whether there, it is possible to do what a non-deterministic Turing machine does or whether basically the measurement process is going to essentially lose you what you might think you gained by following all these all those paths non-deterministically. Okay, so where does that leave quantum computing? I mean, as a practical matter, you know, the investigation of, of using sophisticated ideas from physics for computers, super good idea, lots of great things, lots of optical computing methods, lots of other kinds of, of good methods, but does it really get the quantum brand? Not clear because it may be that in fact, 
those practical problems people have been having with decoherence and quantum computers, those are actually not just practical problems, they're theoretical problems too. And they have to do with this corralling back of, of things from branch hill, from the outer reaches of branch hill space. And an understanding that better is gonna give one more limits, more understanding of what's possible in quantum computers, what's not. And, and there may still be a very practical, important speed up, but the official quantum brand, you know, I did it all with quantum mechanics and it followed all those parallel paths might not be really justified. But for one comment, it could be that the expansion of the universe in branchial space is what, just like you could in some sense make a perpetual motion machine by using the expansion of space, you might be able to make your quantum computer by using the expansion of the universe in branchial space. That's a current speculation. Um, let's see. So um, it's a, uh, uh, all right, let's see. There's all kinds of questions here. There's one from Marcos here. Can we do ruleal space models for the hyperedge rules just like we did for Turing machines? Oh yeah, yeah, we can. It's just vastly more complicated. I mean, I, I, I did the Turing machine case because it's super easy compared to even the string rewriting case. I'm going to do, I'll probably do multi, uh, mobile automata next. Um, and we're working up to being able to do this for the full hypergraph system. But this is, this is kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult. The visualization is difficult. Telling what on earth is going on is difficult. Hopefully we're gonna have some good virtual reality uh, ways of visualizing some of our graphs pretty soon. Um, that might help if I don't get too motion sick in virtual reality. Um, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's just it's just a lot of technical difficulty to build up to that. Um, let's see. There's a question here. Uh, there's a question back here. Does this suggest that p versus mp is undecidable? It is one of my guesses that it is undecidable. Now, uh, the question will end up being in this geometrization of p versus mp. It's an interesting question. What is the analog? What is the undecidability? And I think what it'll be is you've got this thing, it's this basically ball of deterministic computations, and it will have little tentacles that it's sending out. As the ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your basic question is, do the tentacles always reach out? How far do the tentacles reach? Is there a limiting process in which this ball that's getting bigger and bigger eventually somehow fills an outer ball or not? Or do, are there these little tentacles that get uh, these very fine tentacles that start developing? And it could very well be the case that what's happening is that to answer the question of in the infinite limit, which is what you're concerned about with P versus NP, that you can never know whether there are tentacles that reach out and reach to, the, to that outer surface that you need, or whether, whether in fact there are, whether that's not the case. And, and I think it might be possible, even thinking in these geometrical terms, to have a cleaner formulation of, of the undecidability of P versus NP. And that would be very interesting. Uh, I'm, my own guess is that probably it's undecidable um, in the sense that within Piano arithmetic, for example, within an axiom system, if you ask, see, see, whenever you ask one of these infinite limits, you're sort of thrown into being talking about in terms of axiom systems. If you just say, what will the Turing machine do after a billion steps? Well, I can just run it and see. If you say, what does the machine do after a, an infinite number of steps? I have to reason about that. I can't just say, well, I just run it and see. I mean, I might be able to just run it and see. I might be lucky that after a hundred steps, I might have the answer, but I might have to go arbitrarily far. And so the only way to really deal with that reliably is to be able to reason, to be able to generate a proof of what the Turing machine does. But like the Turing machine itself, the proof could be arbitrarily long. By the way, I might mention that in the, um, one of the things that might come out of category theory is a, Okay, let, let me actually, here's a, here's a really weird one, and I, this is still a speculation, but I'll share it with you. Um, this is the why does the universe exist question. So just because there exists an abstract rule that will generate the universe, why should that rule be actualized? Why should, and I think maybe I mentioned this in a previous live stream, but it's the thinking is slowly getting a little crisper. So what I want is, a proof of the existence of the universe. So what on earth would that mean? So let me give you an analogy of what Kurt Gödel did in 1931. So he wanted to turn metamathematics into mathematics. 
Metamathematics is things like, is there a proof? Does a proof exist for this statement? Or, you know, the predicate, uh, is this statement provable? And so the, the statement, is this the predicate, is this statement provable, doesn't seem like it's a statement about mathematics. It doesn't seem like it's a statement about X's and Y's and integers and things like that. It seems like it's a metamathematical statement, okay? So the, um, uh, but what he did was to show that that metamathematical statement can be represented in mathematical terms. He invented Gödel numbering, which was sort of the first form of programming, where he said, let me just write out the proof, blah, 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 by taking the symbol plus and turning it into a power of a prime and the symbol equals sign and turning it into some other power of some prime or something. And out of that proof, I will get a number. And that number, then the, the question of whether a proof is valid will turn into a question about that number. And that question can then be represented in terms of equations about numbers. So then you've turned this metamathematical statement about proofs into a mathematical statement about numbers. And so that's how he took the statement, this statement is unprovable, showed that that could be compiled into arithmetic. And that kind of proves that because that statement, it, sort of arithmetic would blow itself up if it could be, you know, is that statement provable? Is it not provable? The, that establishes that there are statements that are statements of arithmetic, like that statement, because it's a statement of arithmetic, because he showed you could compile that metamathematical statement into arithmetic. And then he showed that that's an example of a statement that is, is undecidable from arithmetic. And it is a statement, so there's incompleteness in arithmetic. It's a statement that can be stated in terms of arithmetic, but it cannot be proved or disproved by finite proof from the axioms provided in arithmetic, okay? Okay, why is all this relevant to us? Well, let's imagine that we wanted to prove the existence of the universe, okay? So right now, the statement, this, our universe exists, does not seem to be a statement about physics does not seem to be a statement that we can make in terms of physics. But the goal, like Gödel, found a way to make a, a, a compilation of the metamathematical statement about proofs as a statement of arithmetic. Our goal is to compile the statement, the universe exists, into a statement that can be stated in terms of operations of the physical universe, okay? Now, unfortunately, I don't have a great punchline here because I don't know how to do that. Um, there are, in fact, Gödel, strangely, had a proof of the existence, or was it non-existence, I'm not sure, of God. Very bizarre thing to do. A statement, in and there are proofs that go back. To, there's one famous one due to St. Anselm. Um, it is the so-called ontological argument. Um, and the argument goes, you know, you assume that Gosh, I'm not sure I can reproduce it. Maybe Jonathan knows how, how this works. It's a, you know, that which there is no greater than, um, there is, there must be something which there is no greater than. Jonathan, can you, can you reproduce Yeah, yeah. It, it, th that's pretty much the essence of it. You say, we, we define God to be that than which nothing greater can be conceived. And then, so Anselm's original argument goes, so then a, a God which exists in reality is greater than a God which exists only in the mind. And therefore, in order for God to be consistent with his own definition of being that than which nothing greater can be conceived, God must exist in reality and not just in the mind. That's the essence of the argument. Effectively, what it's doing is defining a total order on greatness and then, and then specifying there must be a maximal element and then defining that maximal element to be God. Okay, that was so, so anyway, the goal would be to do a similar thing for the proof of existence of the universe. Um, and then my speculation is that the proof of existence of the universe is uh, undecidable from within the universe. That is, that from within the, quote, axiom system defined by the rules of the universe, the statement the universe exists is not provable within that axiom system. So there's an analogy to this, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Given the axioms of arithmetic, you can't prove or disprove the consistency of arithmetic. In other words, if you are living inside arithmetic, you can't get out to... Um, to see from the outside the consistency of arithmetic. So similarly, possibly, using something like that ontological argument, it might be possible to turn the statement, this the universe exists, into a statement that can be compiled into a statement 
And then you would be able to show potentially that the existence of the universe is simply not decidable to entities within the universe. A rather bizarre result, but, but um, uh, that, that's so it's kind of a downer because it says, we'll never know why the universe exists. Um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, there's a comment here that Gödel was a, was, um, was a strange person. Yeah, I, 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 Gödel um, uh, died before I was sort of on the scene, but, but I worked at the Institute for Advanced Study which is uh, where Gödel had worked. Um, and um, so I heard lots of stories when I, I worked there, I started working there in early 1980s. And when I worked there, there were still lots of stories about Gödel that were circulating. I mean, one of the most bizarre stories was, uh, one of the most bizarre meta stories was there were papers from when Gödel had been at the Institute. And back when I was there, I was like, oh, can I see these papers? And I said, like, no, these papers are locked in a vault. You know, no, nobody can see the papers from the Institute from when Gödel was there. So I, I don't, maybe they've been released now. I don't, I don't know whether that's still an ongoing thing. I, I think that partly might be because Gödel wasn't treated that well at the Institute. People didn't really understand the significance of Gödel's theorem at the time. And it, it took many years before he was sort of really accepted. Um, he he'd invented Gödel's theorem long before he came to the Institute when he was um, uh, in, uh, um, in Austria. Um, but um, he, um, uh, in any case, he, he um, um, uh, so that was sort of the first meta strange thing. I think my favorite Gödel story from when I was at the Institute, there was an astronomer, nah, I wasn't a big, big fan of that particular person, but anyway, he, he told me, you know, when he had first been at the Institute, he had run into Gödel and uh, he described all the stuff he was doing with stars and all this kind of thing, but, and, and Gödel had said, oh, that's very nice young man, but I do not believe in natural science. In other words, Gödel didn't believe in the idea of inductive inference in science, didn't believe in the idea that it was possible to make, he only believed in formal theories, so to speak. I mean, he also, Gödel was also famous for the fact that um, his, in, in, you know, he didn't know whether Gödel's theorem applied to minds, and he didn't think it did. He kind of hoped and thought that there was sort of a spirituality to minds that, that went beyond the mere computation, although he didn't really think of it as computation that existed in Gödel's theorem. And in fact, he has a footnote even in his original paper that says that um, you know, maybe human minds evade Gödel's theorem by some kind of ramification of types ramified into the transfinite. Um, the, uh, uh, and that, um, uh, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember there was another, there was some other good Gödel, um, um, uh, you know, Gödel was a very, um, uh, you know, when, when Cohen proved the independence of the continuum hypothesis in set theory, um, there's, a, there's a good story about, um, about Gödel that I've heard. Well, I've heard many stories about Gödel, so I shouldn't. Um, um, he, he was a, uh, you know, I think his strangeness might be a little bit overrated. I think he, he did get a little bit, um, a little bit strange towards the end. He, he, I mean, unfortunately, he, perhaps for justifiable reasons in some ways, he didn't really believe in doctors, medical doctors. Um, and so, that um, as as uh, that that caused some some horrible things to happen, but um, uh, uh, I think it might have been related to his lack of belief in natural science, or it might have been very practical experiences uh, in, in that area. But Gödel, I mean, Gödel was was fond of trying to apply his logical ideas to other things, like for example, his proof of the I think it was the existence of God. Um, he also was famously, um, you know, one of these good stories that I think is a true story, not an apocryphal story, of when. When Gödel was, um, was becoming an American citizen, uh, he was um, supposed to go off and you know, do some hearing or something. And uh, he'd been prepping for this, uh, this you know, citizenship test of that time. And I guess Einstein uh, said, I'll, I'll come along with you to, to help with this. And then Gödel was saying that, well, he had, um, he had figured out that there existed a logical way based on the constitution of the US for the US to become a dictatorship. And um, uh, you know he was, um, uh, which of course was a uh, was um, uh, the and, and so Einstein was like, just don't bring that up at the citizenship hearing. Um, and and um, but you know it was it was Gödel's way of thinking that he was going to apply these kind of logical thinking methods in all areas, whether that was concluding that uh, questions about um, and, and sometimes they're probably more applicable than others. Um, okay. Uh, I need to wrap up here, but but um, uh, I think there were some.
questions about, there's a question about Occam's razor, um, question from Lee about signs of third parties contributing to development. Yeah, there are lots of people working on it. Um, they're not yet, um, um, uh, the few papers starting to appear. We're going to be collecting ones we think are particularly interesting uh, on our website, but um, expect ones to appear. We, we, we have our summer school coming up. We have a lot of people, a lot of well-qualified people um, and talented people coming to that. And I fully expect a lot of interesting papers to come out of that. Um, it's always a funny thing, you know, I feel like when you throw out a theory like this, um, you are, it's like what I do for a living, which is, you know, building Wolfram language and building computational language tools. You know, people say, well, what do people do with your computational language? And I say, you know what? I don't really know. You know, I can tell you a few anecdotal stories, but there's millions of people using it every day. And it's like, they don't tell us what they do with it. And we don't know what they do with it. Um, and it's, it's, so it's a funny thing because, you know, people say, well, what are people doing with your model? And the answer is, well, I, you know, anecdotally, I hear about people doing things, but I can't tell you the global story of what people do with it. And, and that will be, it's an issue in the organization of what we're doing is some, um, uh, and I, I, I actually like to say something that might be relevant to people here. I mean, we are trying to figure out how do we organize this science going forward? And um, we're actually looking for, uh, for people who might be interested in being involved in sort of the organizational side of the science. And, you know, realistically, at some level that starts involving, you know, it involves, you know, how do you get a group of people and pay them? And are they being paid? Are they not being paid? Are they volunteers? Are they this? Are they working at universities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? There's a whole sort of ecosystem that needs to be built. And that ecosystem seems to be, you know, some version of it will work just fine through existing universities and people who are just doing what they do as their day jobs and working on these, these models. That's going to be just fine because, because what we're doing is sort of close enough and methodologically close enough to physics and mathematics and computer science is really not going to be a huge problem with that. But I think that in terms of really developing things in the most effective possible way, there's going to be need to be a little bit more centralization and push and so on. And for that, one needs a, a sort of an ecosystem for the science built up. And we're trying to, just as we're trying to invent new science, we're trying to invent new parts of that ecosystem, like live streaming things as, a, as an example of that, um, that uh, uh, like these bulletins as a mechanism for doing things like, our, you know, the way we're doing our summer school and so on. But, um, uh, you know, we're kind of interested if there are people interested in the kind of the organizational aspects of how to make the science really, really happen in the world. Uh, we'd be interested in hearing from them because we're, we're really trying to figure that out. And um, we kind of need to, you know, we're thinking about assembling a team to really do the sort of organizational aspects of the science. I mean, I, I will say uh, quite straightforwardly, personally, that um, you know, I'm, I am in a sense more personally interested in pursuing the science than the organizational aspects of it. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of my life, well, more than half my life as a CEO of a tech company. Um, and uh, you know, I, I understand how that works and I think it's very productive and I'm very pleased with what we've been able to do. And uh, in, insofar as I can run a piece of the science in the same way that I've, I've, that I've CEO a tech company, I think I can be very productive um, insofar as it's a more kind of um, uh, distributed kind of thing. I, it's, I'm less personally able to contribute expertise to that situation. And we're trying to understand what, uh, you know, and also there's an ecosystem, you know, a tech company, it's basically, you know, we've got, you know, 800 people working on stuff and, you know, people buy our software and, um, you know, that feeds the people who work on making better software. And how that works for physics is not clear. Um, and uh, we won't be able to, uh, uh, you know, we're not gonna, we're, it's unlikely to scale to support a giant physics project selling swag. We haven't yet got swag up and running, but we will and hopefully people will buy some, but I'm not, I'm not uh, expecting that. I will say, by the way, in terms of things that exist, there is um, our, uh, uh, we have the book, the hardcover book version of, um, uh, of, of the launch documents will be coming out in a few weeks. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, okay, so to just leave a bit of a cliffhanger, okay, I'm gonna leave an outrageous cliffhanger here. Uh, there may be a thing that I call quantum money that may be a generalization of blockchain. 
that may come out of the formalism of what we're doing and uh, don't yet really know how it works. And that would be the most bizarre way to see um, a, uh, a kind of a, a, in a sense, a monetization of physics is that its methods allow the construction of a, of a quantum version of money. So I'll leave that, I think we need to wrap up here. I'll leave that as my little cliffhanger um, for, um, uh, for what might come in the future. And um, listen, thanks for your enthusiasm for our project. And um, uh, it's very um, encouraging and um, uh, really helps feed energy into, into what we're doing. Um, and uh, look forward to uh, doing, doing more of these live streams in the future. Oh yes, let me remind you, I have another live stream uh, for a different audience, for kids, talking about um, uh, science and technology tomorrow. I can't spend all my time doing live streams. They, these tend to go awfully long, and that this is because too many good questions. Uh, probably the kids one, we're gonna try and limit it a bit in length otherwise. Otherwise I don't get to explore rural Hill space, which I, which I really like to do and I get, get to do my day job of actually uh, building tools and making a company run. Um, but uh, uh, the, um, um, uh, tomorrow, 3.30 Eastern time, uh, Q&A for kids about science and technology uh, with an emphasis again, because it's been a good topic on uh, how science fiction ideas end up being real. Uh, or not. Okay, well, nice to chat with you all. See you another time.